In this video, I'm going to teach you how to build your own custom job board without writing a single line of code using a tool called Bubble. Damn! Now I know what you're thinking, a job board, it couldn't get any simpler. Well your boy here is always one step ahead and that's why today we're not only going to create a custom job board, but on top of that we're going to build out an internal dashboard which is going to allow recruiters and companies to manage their job listings, as well as also create a way for users to actually apply for positions directly through our platform, from which those companies and recruiters can review a list of all of the applicants and view things like their resumes and cover letters. Now at this point I've already said too much, let me put my money where my mouth is and show you a quick preview of what we're going to be building today. Over on our homepage, we can see a list of all of the currently active jobs across our job board. And if I really wanted, I could filter these by the relevant category that they belong to. So if I wanted to source jobs in design, I could click on this and it would update this list. If I wanted to source jobs in development, this will now also refine my list of jobs from which I could then go and select on a job that I wanna view the full details of. It would then redirect me through to the dedicated page where I can see all of the information related to this job as well as the company that's posted this job ad. And of course, it goes without saying that our application today is gonna to be fully responsive, regardless of the user's device size or browser. So of course, if they're viewing this on mobile or desktop, it's going to be a completely responsive experience. Now on this page, users can even choose to apply for these roles directly in our application. So if they wanted to click this button here, it's gonna trigger a pop-up, which will allow them to upload their cover letter as well as their resume. Then after someone applies for a job role, I'm gonna jump on into my admin dashboard. And I, as a company and recruiter, can view a list of all of the jobs that are currently posted on our platform, from which I can do things like edit the listing, mark it as complete, or even see how many applicants have applied for this role. And of course, if I wanted to view a list of all of those applicants, I can click this button and it's going to display all of our candidates within a pop-up, from which we can then even choose to view their cover letter or even their resume. And when we click on that button, it's going to send us through to view their full resume here, which I can see this person is pretty experienced when it comes to this role. And they make a very convincing argument as to why we should hire them. And because I've now found the perfect candidate for this role, I can choose to mark this job as complete. And it will then be moved over to my list of closed jobs, which just allows me to better manage my listings. And another feature I just wanted to point out is being able to actually search for specific job roles. So back on our homepage here, let's say I want to search for front end developer roles. I can enter in my search query from which I'll then be redirected to a search results page where I can see a dedicated list of all of the relevant jobs to my initial search. Now this just scratches the surface of what I built behind the scenes today. I can't wait to show you all of the other hidden gems that I've created within this whole application. Within our tutorial today, the first thing I wanted to cover was not actually a core feature that users are going to interact with, but instead I just wanted to take the time to set up the necessary data types and fields within our database, which is going to be used to power the rest of our application. Now if you're relatively new to Bubble, the whole process of creating a custom database from scratch can definitely seem a little bit overwhelming, but don't worry, I'm here to walk you through every single step along the way. So that way you can have a complete understanding of how our application is going to run today. Now, when it comes to building out the database or even building out the whole application, I personally like to create a checklist of every single item that I'd like to add into my bubble editor. So you can see today we have a long list of features that we're going to be including within our build. And when it comes to this list, I personally just like to use a tool called Notion, which is just a powerful note taking tool that allows you to create things like a checklist, so that way you can tick each item off along the way as you add it into your build. Now, of course, I'll be sure to include a link to this Notion template, so that way you can make a duplicate version of this and follow along at the same time as me. But what you'll see is that within this Notion doc here, I have a list of all of the different data types and fields I'd like to add into my database. Now, when it comes to creating a database in Bubble, you are gonna hear me refer to data types and fields like I have just done. And the difference between the two is that when you're creating a database from scratch, the first thing you'll need to identify is the overarching data types in your database. Now, data types are the things that users will need to create. 
So whenever I approach a build, I personally just like to sit down first before I design any interface or even create any workflow. And I just like to think hard about what users are actually going to be creating in an application. So within a job board, what I've done is I've just identified the different things that users will be able to create. Now, one of those things is going to be an account. So if a user ever wants to update details about their current job history, as well as store things like a resume or cover letter on their profile, they're gonna to need to create a user account. And so because they're creating an account, that is going to be an overarching thing that this user is going to create within an application. So that's why within my checklist here today, I've added a user data type. Then from here, I've also created a job post data type because users are of course going to be able to publish job posts or job ads, I guess you could call them. Then if I scroll on down my list, you'll see I have a similar data type, which is known as job post content. I'll explain why I've split that into a separate data type in a moment. But the other main thing I just wanna highlight is the application data type. So whenever a user would like to apply for a job, they're going to submit an application, which means they're going to create that within our database. And once again, because a user is creating something, that is going to be an overarching data type. So whenever you're creating an application in Bubble, I'd take the time to sit down and think hard about what are the things or the entities that users are going to need to create in your database, and they will be the overarching data types. Then below each heading within my data types, you'll see I have a long list of all of these checklist items, and these are known as the data fields. And data fields are essentially just the information you'd like to store within each entry created in your database. So for every job post that is created, I'd like to store details about what the role title is, the relevant category, the salary, and then also things like the company name, the company's logo, and so on. And so after you've taken the time to think about what your overarching data types will be, I definitely also recommend sitting down and just sketching out all of the information you'd like to store inside of each entry. And that is what's going to be known as your data fields. Now, if we were to open up a brand new bubble editor, which I've just created one from scratch here, we can head over to our data tab within our editor. And what you'll notice is that this page is broken down into two different sections. On the left hand side, you're able to add in all of your data types. And then on the right hand side, you'll be able to add in all of the data fields within each data type. And so the first thing I wanna do within our build today is just add in all of the data types that I've just covered. And what you'll actually notice is that by default, Bubble has already created a user data type for us. And that's because in order for someone to use our application, they're gonna to need to sign up an account which of course means they're gonna to have to create a new user. So Bubble will automatically provide you with this data type, so you don't need to recreate that. What I would just like to do is add in my next data type, which was my job post. Then you may remember I had a separate data type known as the job post content. So if I just quickly jump back into my Notion checklist here, I just wanted to highlight the difference between the two different data types. And the way I should explain this is just by first giving you a bit of an insight as to how Bubble's actual tool works when it comes to loading data from your database. So let's say on your home page you have a list of job posts that you'd like to display. Now let's say in that list you have 50 different entries, so that's 50 different job posts. Whenever Bubble goes to load that full list of job posts, it will load every single field stored under that data type. And so it's gonna load the role title, the category, the salary, the location, and so on. Even if you don't need to actually display that data on your page, it will load every single one of these fields. And while that's fine whenever you're loading a small list of items, if you were to store some larger data fields on that list, so things like the actual description of the job post or even the company overview, because that data is structured as long form text, it means that Bubble would have to load long paragraphs of text for every single job post. And if it's loading 50 or even 100 job posts, it can quickly get bogged down and slow your application down whenever it needs to load that list. So that's why you'll see in my tutorial today, I've split some of the larger data fields that should technically be under my job post data type into their own data type. And those two fields, as I just mentioned before, is the description of the job post. So a description can be as long as the company or recruiter publishing this ad wants it to be. 
And that's going to include information about what the role is, what kind of experience they want for someone that they hire in that role, or even some information about the company and their objectives. And then there's the field which is known as the company overview. So this is where the company can just share a bit of a history about their company, as well as what they're planning to achieve in the future. And the reason why I've broken these two data fields into a separate data type is because each of the data fields under my job post data type are relatively small and lightweight data fields. So they're only ever going to store just small amounts of text. So for things like the company's name, as well as the role title, that text is quite short. So Bubble will be able to handle loading that relatively easily. However, when it comes to my long form text, there's of course no telling how long that's going to be. And so that's why I've broken it into a separate data type. But what happens if let's say a user's on our homepage viewing a list of all of the job ads and they wanna learn more about a particular job post, what they could do is click on that job post and it would redirect them through to a dedicated landing page where it would display the full details of that job listing. And that is when we can choose to load this additional data. So what we can actually do is create a link between these two data types. And so that way, whenever we need to, we can load this additional data without having to immediately load it on our homepage when we don't actually need to display it. And so that's why I've created a separate data type for our job post content. Now, later on throughout our tutorial, I'm gonna be explaining how we can link these two data types together. But just for the time being, I wanna jump into my bubble editor and add in my job post content. And then finally, the very last data type I'd like to add in is just known as our application. Now that is all of the data types I'll need to add in. However, before I go and build out all of the data fields stored within each data type, there's one last thing I wanna show you. And just when you thought things were getting confusing enough as is, I'm gonna throw something else into the mix, but don't stress, I'm gonna explain it in as much detail as I can. So if I was to jump into my Notion checklist again and just scroll on down, what you'll see is that I've listed out what's known as a series of option sets. Now option sets in Bubble are kind of like data types, only instead of being something that your users will create within your application, option sets are a series of information that you as the admin will only be able to create. So these are something that users can't actually create, but it's data that they will need to select or reference later on in your build. And the best way to explain what an option set is, is just by giving you a real world example. So you'll see here, I have three different option sets. And one of these is known as the job categories. And so each time someone creates a job post in our database, I'd like to store a category for that job post. So is it related to development, design, marketing, or even product? And instead of allowing a user to type in a free text category willy nilly, I as the admin of this application want to set some restrictions around the type of categories that they can select from. So if a user was to start typing in their own category, there's no guaranteeing that they're going to spell it correctly. They might add some typos or even worse, they could actually add a duplicate entry to something that someone else has already created. And then later on, when we go to display a list of all of the categories across our homepage that someone can filter jobs by, there's just going to be an abundance of categories that every single user has created. And so I, as the admin of this application, would just like to control what categories people can select from whenever they either post a job or would like to filter through a list of jobs. And so that is the purpose of an option set. So in my database, I can create what's known as an option set, which as I said, is like a data type. Only instead of users being able to create the entries within that data type, I'm the only person who can create those entries. And for my list of job categories, I'm going to add only these specific entries that people can select from. And that means that whenever a user is to publish a job post, they're going to have to select from a category from my list, which just ensures complete control when it comes to creating a consistent experience throughout your application today. Now, if you're not familiar with option sets or this idea is still a little bit confusing to you, please don't stress. These are a little bit more of an intermediate feature in Bubble. Option sets aren't a feature I actually started using until about a year into my experience. But the reason I'm adding them into my build today is because it's gonna create the most streamlined application. And I just wanna ensure that we're creating the best product possible. And so what I'm gonna do is jump back into my bubble editor here. And within my data menu, what you'll see across the top tab here is just an option sets menu. And this is where you can add in your series of option sets. And so again, option sets are like the data types that only you as the admin can create entries for. 
And so what I'm going to do is add in my option sets from my notion checklist. So the first one was known as the job category. And now when it comes to option sets, I personally don't like to add spaces in between separated words. Instead, I like to use dashes. And the reason I do that is because later on when we reference data from our database, it's going to allow me to easily differentiate between my data types, which don't have dashes, they use spaces and my option sets, which only use dashes. So I'm going to create my job category option set here. And then within this option set, I'm going to create that data that's actually going to be permanently stored in there. So that is known as the actual list of categories that I'd like to create. And so I'm going to go ahead and add in the first option, which was development. Then there was the product category. There was the marketing category. There was design. And then there was also sales. Now, by all means, you can add in as many categories as you would like. Today for our tutorial, I'm only going to add in this short list. But if you wanted to add more options, feel free to pause this tutorial here and go ahead and do that. Now, one thing I should also just point out is that when it comes to storing the data within your option set, right now you can see we have a list of what's known as options. And for each of these entries, we're just storing these as a text value. So if we ever want to reference these, you'll see these are known as the display text option. But when it comes to option sets, you can also store values like dates, images, or even numbers. But I won't go into that because I don't want to confuse you with more details of things that aren't relevant to our build today. So we're just going to keep our option set list short as this list of text based options. If I just jump back into my notion checklist though, the next option set list I'd like to add in is going to be the different types of jobs that people can advertise for. So this will just determine if a role is part time, full time, or if it's even a contract position. So I'm going to jump back into my bubble editor, I'm going to add a new option set. And this is going to be known as job type, I'll choose to create this, then I'll add my three options in as text. So there was part time, there was full time, and then there was contract, it is as simple as that. Then finally, jumping back into Notion, the very last option set I'd like to add in is just going to be the job location. So this will just determine if the job is remote, if it's in an office, or if it's even a hybrid between the two. So I'm going to jump back into Bubble. I will create a new option set, and I'll call this job location. Then I'll add in my options. So I'm just going to say there's the office option, there is the remote option, or there's the hybrid option. And that is all I will need to add in for that option set. It's relatively straightforward. So after adding in all of our data types, as well as all of our option sets, it's at this point that we can go through and start building out all of the data fields that will be stored in our original data types. And now the reason why I decided to build out the option sets before the data fields is because you'll see within my notion checklist, and I'll show you in a moment when we actually add these into bubble. But some of the data fields within our overarching data types need to actually link out to our option sets. So for instance, as I mentioned before, whenever someone goes to publish a job post, they're going to need to link this to a specific category. And when it comes to the categories they can select, I'm only going to allow them to select from the list of pre vetted categories that I've created in our option sets. But we'll build that out when we get to our job post data type. The first thing I'd like to do is just focus on my user data type. So for every account that a user creates, I want to store some information about that person. So this is things like their name, their bio, their profile photo, as well as their current job title and the company that they work for. And this will just allow me to display that information to a recruiter once they view their application through our platform. So if I just jump into bubble, I'm going to head to my data types tab and click on my user data type. And by default, what you'll see under your user data type is you have a data field already known as the email. And so because in bubble in order to actually register an account, a user is going to need to store an email and a password. And so bubble adds the email field in by default. It also does include a password field, but you won't be able to see that in plain text for security reasons. But from here, what we're going to do is create our first data field inside of our user data type. And for this field, we're just going to call this the name. And then whenever you add a field, you'll also need to select what type of data this is going to be formatted as. And so in this instance, it's going to be relatively straightforward. I'd like to store the user's name as just a plain text field, I'll choose to create this. 
Then I'll create another field and I'll call this the profile photo. So of course I'd like to store an image for every user that creates an account. Now, when it comes to my data fields, I also like to separate any words using a dash because once again, it's just going to allow me to easily differentiate between what is a data type that does use spaces from what is a data field, which does not use spaces, it uses dashes. And you'll see what I mean when we go to reference data in our database in a moment. But for now, what I'd like to do is just store the field type of the profile photo to be an image. I'll choose to create this. I'd also like to create a field called bio. So this is the kind of like about me section for each user. I'm gonna set this field type to be a plain text field. It's nice and straightforward. Then there will be the current company. So this is the company that a user works for. And I'm going to allow them to type this in as a text option. I will create that. And then finally, I'll create a field called current job title. And this will once again, just be a plain text field because I'll allow someone to type in what their job title is. I'll choose to create that. And that is all of the data fields I'd like to add within our user data type. So I'm gonna jump back into my Notion checklist, highlight all of these fields and choose to tick those off. And then from here, we can move on down to our job post data type, which is definitely one of our larger data types. So every single time a company or recruiter publishes a job ad, I'd like to store a bit of information about things like the actual role title, the category it belongs to, the salary for the job, and so on. And so I'm gonna jump into my bubble editor, open up my job post data type, and I'm gonna create a new field. And the first field is going to be, of course, my role title. I'm gonna set this field type to be a text field. It's nice and straightforward. Then I'd like to store a category for each job post that is created. So I'm gonna call this the category field. Now, when it comes to this field type, as I mentioned before, I want this to link out to my list of option sets that we had previously created because I only want users to select from that pre-vetted list that I had built. I don't want them to be able to type in their own category. So for this field type, I'm gonna scroll on down and what you'll see is I can select from our job category option set. I'm going to select this. I will then choose to create this field. Then for the next field, I'd like this to be the salary of this job. And I'm going to format this as a number. Now, while you could technically format this as just a text field and type numbers into that text field, when you use an actual number field, Bubble allows you to automatically format that as a currency with a currency symbol on it, if you would like. So that's why I'm selecting the number field type here. I'll choose to create this field. Then I'd like to create the next field, which is going to be the location of our job. And so this is going to link to that list of option sets we created. So is this job going to be in an office? Is it gonna be remote or will it be a hybrid between the two? So for this field type, I'm gonna scroll in down to my job location option set list. I'm gonna select that. So now I've created a link between the two. I'll choose to create this. Then while we're also linking to our option set list, I wanna create another field and this will be known as our role type. So is this a part-time, full-time, or even a contract position? And so for this field type, I'm going to link this, of course, to my job type option set list. I'll choose to create this. Now for the next field, I'd like to call this the application link. Now throughout our product today, we are going to allow users to actually apply for jobs directly within our application. And then from there, we're gonna build out a dashboard page that companies and recruiters can use to review a list of all of their job applicants. But sometimes companies actually prefer to use their own external application link. So that might link out to an external page on their own website that they prefer users to apply through. And so today I wanna to create a feature that allows anyone creating a job post to also link out to their website if they would prefer. However, this is not mandatory. And so when it comes to this field type, I'm gonna set this to be a text option because when it comes to the external application link, someone's just going to copy the link from their URL, they can paste it in this field, and then we can build out a feature later on that automatically redirects someone through to that page whenever they want to apply for a role through an external application link. For the meantime though, I'm just gonna to choose to create this field. And the next field I'd like to create is going to be known as the complete field. So this is almost gonna be like the status of this job ad. So is it currently active or is it currently complete? And so what you can do with this field type is actually set this as a yes, no option. 
So it either is complete or it's not complete. And of course, later on in our recruiter dashboard, we're gonna create a way for recruiters and companies to be able to update the status of their job ads so they can choose to mark them as complete if they've found a suitable applicant for that role. Now I'm gonna create this field, but what I'd also like to do is just update the default value of this field. I'd like to set this to be no, so that way by default, a job post is not complete. It's only going to be complete when a recruiter or company marks it as complete within their own dashboard. But I'll explain more on that when we actually build out that feature. From here though, I'd like to create another field and this is just going to be called the company name. So whenever someone creates a job post, they'll be able to add the name of their company within that. And this field type is just going to be a simple text choice. I will create that. And while we're storing information about the company that is publishing this job ad, I'm gonna create another field which is gonna be called the company logo. So this is like the profile photo for a company. So this field type is just going to be an image type because of course we're storing a photo. I'll choose to create that. And I'd also like to create another field which is gonna be known as the company website link. And so on a dedicated job landing page where we display the full information of a job description, I'd also like to display the details of a company. And of course, I want someone to be able to click through to the company's website where they could actually learn more about that company. And so I'm gonna allow companies to store their external website link. And when it comes to this field, similar to our external application link, I'm gonna set this to be a text field and we can build out a feature later on that redirects someone through to the company's website. But for the time being, I'm just gonna create this. Now for a company, I would also like to store an office address. So that way I can show the user in what city the headquarters of this company is based in. Now, of course, this field might not be mandatory if you're building something like a remote job board, but I at least just wanted to show you the process of being able to store an actual physical address if you would like. So I'm gonna to choose to create a new field here and I'm gonna call this field company office address. And when it comes to this field type, I'm gonna set this to be a geographic address, which later on, I'm gonna show you how we can integrate this with Google Maps. So that way we can search through a list of real world addresses that they can select from. I'll choose to create this for now because there's two last things I'd like to store about a company. And one is how many employees they have. So I'm gonna create a new field and I'm gonna call this field company employee count. Now for this field type, you might assume that this could be a number because we're obviously storing a count of something, but I'm actually going to select this to be a text field. And the reason is, is as I'd mentioned before, unless you're, and the reason for that is because as I'd mentioned before, unless you wanna format something as a currency, or even unless you want to actually perform a calculation on two numbers, if you're storing a number that's just going to be displayed as text. So let's say if it was something like 50, I don't actually need to store that as a number in my database. I can just store that as text and display that number as a text value. So that's why I'm gonna select the text option here today. I'm then gonna to choose to create this. Then there's one last field I'd like to store for our company data, and that is going to be the year it was founded. So I'm gonna create another field, and I'm gonna call this company year founded. And once again, I'm not gonna format this as a number. I'm just going to store this as a text entry. I'll choose to create that. And the very last field I'll need to add within my job post data type is a way to link this through to my job post content. So because I'm splitting out the larger data fields like the description of the job post, as well as the company overview, I'll of course need to create a way to link these two together. And so in my database, under my job post data type, I'm gonna create a field and I'm gonna call this job post content. And when it comes to this field type, I'm gonna scroll on down and link this to my separate data type, which is known as our job post content. I'll choose to create that. And that's everything I'll need to add within my job post data type. So I'm gonna jump over into my database I'm gonna highlight all of the data fields under my job post and I will tick those off. Then below this, I'm gonna add in the data I wanna store within my job post content. And these are relatively straightforward. So over in Bubble, I'm gonna open up my job post content 
And as I'd mentioned before, the first field is going to be the description of the job post. So this is going to be a long form string of text. So I'm going to set the field type to be text. I'll create this. And then finally, there was the company overview. So this was the information about the company's history, as well as what their objectives are. And this, of course, is going to be another text field type. It's nice and straightforward. So I will create this. I can then jump back into Notion once again, tick those data fields off, and then add in the very last data fields, which is for the application data type. So every single time someone creates an application, I'm going to want to store some information about it. And within that, I'd like to store things like who the applicant is, as well as a file, which is their resume, as well as another file, which is their cover letter. And then finally, I'd like to link this application through to a job listing. So that way someone can view a list of all of the applicants who have applied for a particular job. So I'm going to jump into bubble, open up my application data type. And the very first field I'm going to create is going to be the resume field. So for every application, I want someone to be able to upload both a resume and a cover letter. Now for this field type, I'm going to set this to be a file. So that way users can upload something like a PDF file. I'll choose to create this. Then as I mentioned, I'd like to create another field, which is known as our cover letter. This is also going to be a file type. I will create this. Then of course, I'd like to recognize who the applicant is for each particular application. So I'm going to link this field to our user data type. So that way I can identify who the user is who has submitted this application. I will create this. Now, one thing I should point out is that by default, whenever you create something in your database, Bubble is actually going to create a link to a person who created each entry. So you'll see under every single data type, you have a default field known as the creator. And so that's going to link through to the person who created that specific entry. But for the sake of our tutorial today, I've also just wanted to create a separate field known as our applicant. And I'm also going to link that through to a user just so that way we can consciously create that link. But from here, there's one last field I'd like to add in, and that is going to be a way to link an application through to a dedicated job post. So let's say within a company or recruiter dashboard, they're going to be able to view a list of all of the jobs that they've published. And from there, when they select into each job ad, what I'd like to do is display a list of all of the applicants for that specific job. And so I'm going to create a field and I'm going to link this to an original job post, but I'm just going to abbreviate this as OG job post. And for the field type, I'm going to link this through to our job post data type. So I'm going to create a connection between both of our data types here. I will choose to create that. And that is the very last field I'd like to add into our application data type. So if I jump back into my notion checklist, I can tick all of these fields off. And that is actually the entire process of creating a custom database from scratch. There is one last thing I'd like to point out though, and that is that if we jump back into our bubble editor here, you may have seen on the right hand side of our data types, we had this little label here, which is known as the privacy settings. And what you'll see is that by default, your user data type has a privacy rule applied to it. So if we click into this, essentially what this default privacy rule means is that users are only able to see the data that they create within our application. So currently, if a user was to create a job post, they are the only person who is able to view that. And that is not the experience we want to create. We want users to be able to create job posts and then have those be publicly visible on our actual application. And so what I'm going to do is head over to this little trash can icon and I'm going to choose to delete this default privacy setting. And then what you'll notice is that your user data type has become publicly visible, which is the exact experience we want to create. And to be honest, that wraps up everything that I wanted to cover within the database section of this tutorial today. I know there was a lot to cover in this and particularly considering if you are new to bubble, this can definitely seem a little bit overwhelming as it's the first thing we touch base on. But as I mentioned at the start of our tutorial, taking the time to actually build out the database is essential to build out the rest of the application on top of it. But if you found yourself getting lost at any point in time, I really recommend taking the time to pause this tutorial and rewatch any sections that I've just covered. But like anything, what you'll find is that the more practice you have, the easier this will get. 
After taking the time to set up and configure our database, we can move along down to the list of features I have laid out for us in my Notion checklist today. And as you'll see, this is quite an extensive list of features, just because I wanna cover everything in as much detail as I possibly can. But the first thing on my list that I'd like to dive into is just walking you through the process of building out the home page for our job board. So this is gonna be the main page that users will interact with in order to discover jobs within our platform. And there is a little bit involved within this process, but of course I'm gonna explain everything in as much detail as I can along the way. So let's just head over to our bubble editor. And at this point in time, I've just opened up my index page within my application, which is a default page that comes with every single bubble application. So if I was to open up my page drop down menu here, you'll see that the index page has already been added. And so the index page is the default page that will be opened whenever someone decides to launch your application. And at this point in time, our index page is currently blank. Before I take the time to add any elements onto this page, however, I'm just gonna need to make a couple of quick changes. So I'm gonna double click on the page here and it's going to open up my property editor within Bubble. So this allows me to edit all of the details of our page here. And the first thing I'd like to do is just update the background color of this page. So at this point in time, this page is currently white and so I can't really see it within my Bubble editor. So what I'd like to do, and this is just a personal preference of mine, is that I just like to update the color of this to be a light shade of gray. And if I click away, I can now see where the borders of my page lie in regard to the Bubble Editor canvas itself. And now, although I've added a background color to this page, if I wanted to preview or publish my application, I could remove this and set it back to be white. However, just while I'm working in our application, I do want to keep this as that light shade of gray. The other thing we'll need to do before we can go ahead and actually add elements onto our page is just jump over to this layout tab within our property editor and you'll see an option to select the container layout of your page. Now in Bubble, the container layout just refers to the overall structure of your page and how elements will be positioned on it. And so if we were to open up this menu here, you'll see there's four different options that we can select from. And there's no need to be overwhelmed because I personally only ever use two of these options, which are the row and the column options. And essentially the difference between the two is that if you were to select the row option, and then if you wanted to start adding elements on your page, like buttons and images, these would all be positioned horizontally across your page. So they would be in a row. Whereas with the column option, it would allow you to stack elements on your page vertically. So from top to bottom. And I think the best way to illustrate this is just by showing you a quick example. So if I was to just go ahead and add two button elements onto my page here, and then click on my overall page, head to my layout tab, and now set the container layout to be a row, what you'll see is that these two button elements are positioned horizontally across our page. So they're side by side. Whereas if I was to update the container layout to be a column, you'll see that these are now stacked on top of each other, so vertically. And now when it comes to your overall page, in 99% of all of the use cases I build within Bubble, the container layout of your overall page should be a column. Because when you think of most applications, the pages are built from the top down. Although they definitely do have elements that span horizontally across a page, the actual overall page design and structure is positioned vertically, so from top to bottom. And so today we're gonna set the column container layout option. And you'll see me select that across any other page I create within our tutorial today. I am just going to delete these buttons off my page because now I'd like to add the very first element onto our page and that is going to be the hero section of the job board. And so this is just going to include a section that has a colored background followed by some hero text just to notify the user what our job board is about. And perhaps a good example that I should show you that we're gonna be modeling our application of today is the We Work Remotely website. So if I just open this in a new tab here, the first thing you'll notice on this page is that they have a hero section at the top which just displays a large heading as well as some additional text. And then of course, if we scroll on down, we can see a list of all of the jobs that have been added or posted to this particular job board. And so if we were going to replicate this experience here, I'm gonna jump back into my bubble editor. And the first thing I'm gonna to wanna to do on my page is just add in what's known as a group element. So if we were to jump back over into WeWork remotely very quickly, 
what you'll see is that the first section of this page is almost in its own, I guess you could say container, which is then followed by the rest of the page itself. And so what I want to do is add a container onto my bubble app that's going to house all of the text elements. So if I jump into bubble, I'm going to scroll on down to my containers menu and we're going to add a group element into our page. So I'm going to select to add this in. Now, if you're relatively new to bubble, Groups are, as the name would suggest, they allow you to group elements into one particular container. So let's say you have a series of different elements like some text, some images, and some buttons. Groups allow you to have control over where all of those elements are positioned inside of this field, not within your overall page. You can kind of think of groups as small pages within your overall page. And the reason I say that is because if we select on our group element here and open up our property editor, under the layout tab, you'll also notice that groups have the container layout option, which is the same option we saw on our page. And so that means that within this small group here, so in this area space, we can determine in which way elements should be displayed. So should they be positioned horizontally or should they be positioned vertically? Now in our example today, I'm gonna to once again update the container layout to be a column because if we look at the WeWork remotely website, you can see that all of these elements are stacked on top of each other. So they're not positioned horizontally, instead they're positioned vertically. And so that's why our column option is gonna be the best fit. Now, before I update any of the responsive settings for the width of this group, I'd just like to jump over to my appearance tab and remove the style of this group because I'd like to add a solid background color to this. So that way I can actually see where it's gonna sit on my page because right now it's just this transparent square. And so what I'm gonna do is add the background style to be a flat color. And in this case, I have a purple color code that I'd like to add in, or I guess you could even say it's a shade of blue. But if you'd like that color code, it's 6B6BFF. And now we'll be able to see where this group actually sits on my page. I'm then gonna jump over into my layout tab here because I'd like to have this group span across the full width of my page, regardless of its size. And so this is where we're gonna start creating our responsive experience today. So that way, regardless if a user is viewing this page on a desktop or a mobile, they're gonna have a fully responsive experience that's gonna be intuitive to use. And so in order to achieve that, we're going to head on down to our width settings here. And at this point, I can see that our group has a fixed width of 280 pixels, which just means that on our overall page, this group will only ever be 280 pixels in width at any given time. It won't be any larger and it won't be any smaller. And now that's not the experience we want to create. Instead, we want to unselect that this should be a fixed width. And what you'll see is that bubble will apply a maximum width now, and this is going to be infinite. So what that essentially just means that as this page expands out, this group is going to have an infinite max width. So it's gonna take up as much width as it possibly can. You can kind of think of this group as the hungry, hungry caterpillar. It's just not gonna know when to stop eating the width on our page. And so it's just going to indefinitely stuff itself with all of the width. However, what you will see is that the minimum width of this group is still at 280 pixels. And now when it comes to creating a fully responsive experience in Bubble, what I personally like to do in most instances is set the minimum width to be zero, which just means that regardless of how small this page becomes, this group will contract down to the smallest possible size, which is zero pixels. And now if I was to jump over into my responsive menu here, what you'll see is a preview of how this group or page is going to look on certain device sizes. So on a desktop, what you'll see is that at 1200 pixels, this group is going to take up the entirety of our page width. However, on a mobile device, which is 320 pixels, what you'll see is that the width of this group has now expanded to become this size. And look, if I was to drag this out, you'll see that it will indefinitely be responsive. And so this is the start of how we can create fully responsive applications inside of Bubble. I'm gonna jump back over to my UI builder here though, because I'd like to now start adding my text elements into this group. So under my visual elements, I'm gonna to select to add my first text element into this group. And this is going to display the hero text on my page. So I'm gonna have this display the words startup job board, and I'm gonna leave that in all caps. I'm then gonna to want to update the style of this text element. So I'm gonna to head to our styling. I'm gonna remove the default style that was applied to this. 
And the first thing I'll do is update the font size here to be a 46. So that way it is larger. I'll also choose to update the color of the text to be white. From here, I'll then bold this text. And finally, I just like to update the font we're going to be using. I'm going to use this font called Backpack One. I'll select that. And now at this point in time, you can see that our text is looking good. However, it's obviously not spanned out across the width of our page. So what we're going to need to do is, of course, jump into our layout tab and update the width settings. Similar to our purple, or I guess you could say blue group, I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. And now this means that this text element will by default have an infinite max width. So it's going to take up as much space as it can within our group here. I am of course going to then set the minimum width as zero. So that means it's going to take up as little or as much space as it possibly can. Now while we're here, I'm also going to update the minimum height to be zero. And the reason I'm doing that is because we have this option selected by default, which fits the height of this element to the content inside of it. So that just means that the border you see around this text element will always collapse nicely around the text that fits inside of it. So if I was to update the font size to let's say be 12, the element itself will collapse around that text. So you can now see that the height is fully responsive as well as the width. I'm just going to revert that change though. One thing I will also need to do is center align this text inside of our element. And now you'll see that will be in the center of our page. I'll also just jump to my layout tab because I'd like to add some margin around this particular element just so I can space it out within our group here. And when it comes to the margins, I'm going to add in 50 pixels of margin at the top, 20 pixels of margin on the left and 20 pixels of margin on the right. And what that's going to do is just ensure that this text element never touches the borders of my page. So if I was to jump over into my responsive tab once again, and if I wanted to reduce the width of this page, you'll see that this element will take up as much or as little space as it can, whilst also factoring in that it has 20 pixels of margin on each side. So that means that this text is going to collapse if the user's device size is smaller. So now we have a fully responsive experience across our text element. Just jumping back into my UI builder, I'd also like to add in an additional text element into my blue group here. So I'm going to head to my visual elements once again. I'll add a text element in here. And I'm going to have this text element display the words browse jobs at some of the world's best startups. Now, similar to before, I'd like to update the style of this text element. So I'm going to remove the default style here. I will update the font size to be 24. I'll also select that the font color should be white. I can then center align this text and I'd also like to set this in italics. I'm not going to worry about bolding this or changing the actual font style. I will, however, just jump into my layout tab because I'll need to make this element fully responsive as well. So like before, I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'm going to set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. And now you'll see me reference that a lot throughout our tutorial today. And that is because this is how we're going to create a fully responsive experience. I'm also going to set the minimum height to be zero because we have the option selected to fit the height of this element to the content within it. And then finally, I'd like to add in 20 pixels of margin at the top. I'm also going to add in 80 pixels of margin at the bottom because this is the last element I'd like to add within this overall blue group. I'll then add 20 pixels of margin on the left and at 20 pixels of margin on the right. And now one thing I should point out is that although we have 80 pixels of margin at the bottom of this text element, you can see there's some additional space between where it ends and where my overall group ends. And that's because I'm going to need to select on my blue group here. And if I head to its layout tab and head on down to the height settings, what you can see is that although we have the default option selected to fit the height of this element to the content inside of it, this group has a minimum height, which means that at any given time, this group will be 280 pixels in height. It's not allowed to go any smaller than that. However, if I was to set the minimum height to now be zero, that means that this group can collapse vertically. And because we have the option selected to fit the height of this element to the content inside of it, it's going to finish exactly where the margin ends within our text element. And that is how we can create our hero section. Now below this, what I'd like to do before I display a list of jobs that have been published on our job board today, I'm going to display a list of categories that users can filter jobs by. And so before I do that, I'm just going to add a text element onto our page below our blue group. 
So this is now sitting on the page itself. And what you'll see is that because we've selected the container layout of our overall page to be a column, this is going to stack vertically below our existing container at the top here. And now the reason I've added this text element in is because I'd like this to almost be like a header for our categories. So I'm just gonna have this display the words browse jobs by popular categories. I'm then gonna choose to remove the style of this text just because I'd like to update the font size here to be 16. I'd also then like to bold this text here. And for the color of this text element, I'd like to update this to be a custom color code. However, because I'd like to use this shade of black that I'm about to add in across every text element that is black within my application, instead of just updating the color here for a one-time use, what we can actually do is head on over to our styling menu, which you may not have seen within Bubble. So if I click on the styles option here, then open up my styling variables. What you'll see is a list of default colors that have been selected for particular elements within Bubble. And what I can see is that for our default text element, and so if I was to click on the default color code, you'll see that this is a dark shade of black. However, what I'd like to do is add in my own custom color code for the shade of black I would like to use. And that color code is 43403F. And so this is just a personal preference of mine. It's just a lighter shade of black, which is gonna look a bit more enticing across our application. And so now whenever I add in a text element, this is gonna be the default color of it. So if I jump back into my design tab, what I'll see is that the text element I've added onto my page has now also updated to be that new color code. And as you can see, it's just a lighter shade of black, which in my opinion, just looks a bit more enticing. I'm then gonna to jump to our layout tab for this text element because I'd like to make this fully responsive. Of course, I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. Like always, I'm gonna set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. So that way this element can be as small or as large as it would like to be across this page. I'm also gonna update the minimum height to be zero, and you'll see it's going to collapse around this text because we have this default option selected. Then while we're in our layout tab, I'm also just gonna add in 20 pixels of margin at the top, 20 on the left and 20 on the right. And that's just going to position this text element further down on our page. Now from here below this, what I'd like to do is display a list of all of the categories that someone could filter through a list of jobs by. And of course, those categories have already been added into our database within our option sets. So if you remember when we were setting up our database under our option sets, we had an option set called job category. Now within this, I just added in a small list of categories that users could filter jobs by. And it's at this point that I'd like to display all of these options within our homepage horizontally across as a menu. And essentially, whenever someone clicks on one of these categories on our homepage, what I'd like to do is just filter through all of the jobs that are being displayed by the selected category. So if I just jump into my design tab, what I'm gonna do is need to add in a list of all of these categories. And now in order to add a list into your application, you'll need to use what's known as a repeating group element inside of Bubble. And now this is by far one of the most powerful elements you'll ever use inside of Bubble. So I'm gonna scroll on down to my containers menu and I'm gonna to choose to add a repeating group onto my page. And what you'll see is that this repeating group kind of just looks like a spreadsheet in the sense that it has a number of different rows. Repeating groups, however, are where you can create truly dynamic experiences using lists within your application. And a great example is, let's say you were building an Instagram clone and you wanted to create a feed of Instagram posts on your homepage. A repeating group element is the element you would use to do that. So essentially, this element's gonna plug straight into your database and you can tell it to display a list of all of the posts that users have published. And inside each cell, it's going to dynamically display each individual post. And what I mean by the word dynamic is that it's just going to automatically pull that data from your database. So it's not like you need to manually curate what's going to be inside of each cell in this repeating group. Bubble's just gonna know what to display because it's going to pull that data from your database. And so in our example today, what I'd like to do is display a list of all of those categories in our option sets horizontally across the top of our page. And so what you'll need to do for a repeating group before you can update any of the layout settings is give this a data source. So because this is going to dynamically pull data from your database, it needs to know what data it should actually display inside of this list. 
And this one's nice and simple. So today we're going to just open up our drop down menu. And for the type of content, I'd like to display the job category option set. So now Bubble's going to know that it needs to pull that data from our option set list. However, we will need to tell it of the job categories, which ones we want to display. And this is also super straightforward. In this case, I just want to display all of my job categories. So now this is going to show all of the options I've added into that list. Now from here, what I'll also need to do is update the options of how many rows and columns I want to display within this repeating group. So at this point in time, you can see there is four rows with one column. Whereas today, what I'd like to do is display my list of job categories horizontally across my page. So I'm actually going to unselect that this should be a fixed number of rows and also unselect that this should be a fixed number of cells. Then I'd like to update the scroll direction of this repeating group. So that's just going to determine in which way a user can scroll through this list of items. So because we're pulling data from our database, let's say there is a hundred different entries that we want to display within this list. Bubble will in fact display all of those 100 and a user can just scroll through those like they would on let's say an Instagram feed if they were scrolling through the home page. And so by default, the scroll direction of a repeating group is set to vertical scrolling, which just means that a user can scroll in this repeating group from top to bottom, which again, to my example of the Instagram clone is the same as let's say the homepage of an Instagram feed. However, today, what I'd like to do is just display a list of these categories horizontally across my page. And if for some reason, all of these categories don't fit on my page at any given point in time, I want users to be able to scroll horizontally across this repeating group. So you can kind of think of that like how if you're looking at a carousel post on Instagram, so a post that has multiple images, you can swipe side by side in order to view the rest of those. And so if we open up this scroll direction drop down menu, I'm going to update this to be the horizontal scrolling option. Then from here, I'm going to jump over into our layout tab. And before I update the width of our repeating group, I'm going to need to also update the container layout for this repeating group. So as the name would suggest, a repeating group is a group element. So you can kind of think of it like a list of groups. So each cell within our repeating group is a group in its own right. And so because this is a group, we can determine what the container layout will be within each of these cells. And now for our repeating group today, I'm actually going to only add one element inside of it. So it doesn't really matter what the container layout is between the row and column option. I am personally just going to select the row option, however. And the reason I'm doing that is because it'll give us these additional container alignment choices. So this will just allow me to determine how the element I add into this is horizontally positioned. I'm then going to scroll and add to my width and I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. Like before, I'm then going to update the minimum width to be zero and I'm going to set the maximum width as infinite. So that way this repeating group will take up as little or as much space as it possibly can on our page. I will come back later and update the height as well as the margins for this repeating group. But before I do that, what I'd like to do is start adding the elements inside of this repeating group. And so for the elements I'd like to add into our repeating group today, they're going to be relatively straightforward. The first thing I'd like to do is add in a group that's going to look like a colored tag. And then inside of that, I'm going to add a text element that displays the name of each job category. So if I head to my containers menu here, I'm going to select to add a group element inside of our repeating group. Now, before I update the container layout for this group or even the width settings, I'm going to jump to my appearance tab because I just like to give this a background color. I'm going to choose to remove the style of this existing group and I'm going to set the background style to be a flat color. And for the color code of this group, I'm just going to paste in the same color code I used for the hero section of my page. So it's just that shade of blue. If you'd like that color code again, it's 6B6. B -double -F. While we're in our appearance tab, I'm also just going to update the roundness of this group's borders. So if I set this to be 100, you'll see it'll have some curved borders around it now. I'm also then just going to jump into my layout tab because now I can update the container layout for this group. So as I mentioned inside of this group, I'm only going to add one element and that is going to be a text element that displays the relevant job category. And so once again, it doesn't really matter what I select as the container layout. So I can either choose between the row or the column options. However, in this case, I'm just going to select the row option once again. Now, when it comes to the width of this group, I'm going to, like always, unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'm going to set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. So that way it's going to take up as little or as much space as it possibly can within each repeating group cell. 
Now for the height, I will come back later on and update this. However, before I update any additional settings for the layout of this group, what I'd like to do is go ahead and add in the text element that's going to display the actual job category name. And so if I scroll on up to my visual elements, I'm gonna add a text element into this group here. And now one thing I should point out when it comes to this particular text element is that as I mentioned, I want this to display the title of the particular job category that it sits within inside of our repeating group. So because this repeating group is pulling from a list of data from our database, it's going to store the value of each job category within each individual cell. So for example, in the first repeating group cell, this is going to store the very first job category we have stored in our option set list. So if I was to just head over to my option sets, that would be the development option. In cell number two of our repeating group, it would display the word design. Cell number three would be marketing and so on. And so if I jump back into my design tab, for this text element, all I'm gonna need to do is reference the current cell's job category and display the name of it. However, one thing I should point out is that at this point in time, this text element doesn't actually sit directly within our repeating group. It sits within our blue group that sits within our repeating group. And so in order to reference the job category from our repeating group, I'm gonna need to pass some data on through our blue group, which our text element can then reference. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on my blue group here. And what you'll see is that within your group, under the appearance tab, you have the ability to store some data inside of your group. And this is where you'll really start to see the power of groups come to life. Not only can you update the container layout of all of the elements inside this group, but you can actually choose to store data inside of a group as well. And so that's why today within our tutorial, you'll see me frequently leverage group elements. And so for this group, I just wanna store the data of a job category within it. And for the actual job category I'd like to store in this group, it's gonna be the value pulled from our repeating group. So if this group sits within cell one, I want to pull the very first job category from our repeating group. So I'm just gonna reference the current cells job category, which of course is pulled from our repeating group. Then from here, what I'll be able to do is click on my text element. I can choose the option to insert dynamic data, which means that this text is going to be dynamic based on whichever cell of our repeating group we're currently viewing. And I'm gonna reference the parent group's job category. So because this element sits within our blue group, the blue group is known as our parent. And because it's fetching data from our repeating group, we're now passing that data on. So you can see I can reference the job category. And I just like to display the actual title of the job category itself, which is going to be the display text. It's nice and straightforward. What I'd like to do now is just remove the style of this element because I'd like to update the color of this font to be white. I'd also like to align this text in the center of the element and finally bold the actual font itself as well. I'm then gonna jump over into our layout tab because I'll need to update the responsive width settings for this particular text element. Now, like always, I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'm gonna set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. So that way this text element will take up as little or as much space as it possibly can within our blue group. I'm also then gonna set the minimum height to be zero. So that way it collapses around the text inside of the element. Now for the height and width of this element, I would also like to update one additional setting. And that is gonna be this option here to fit the width of this element to the content within it. And I'm gonna actually tick this. Now the reason I'm doing that is because no two job category titles are gonna be the same length or the same width. So for instance, if I was to just jump over into my database, open up my option sets and select the job categories, obviously the words development and marketing are a little bit longer than the words design and sales. And so I want this text element to fit nicely around the text inside of each option. I don't want, let's say, all of my text elements being as long as the word development and then end up with all of this empty space around the text itself. So in order to make this text element wrap nicely around each of the text entries, I'm just gonna tick the option to fit the width of this element to the content inside of it. I'll jump back into my design tab for now though, open up my layout tab once again. And when it comes to the margins of this element, I just like to add in 10 pixels of margin at the top, 10 on the bottom, as well as 30 on the left and 30 on the right. I'm then going to also vertically align this element in the center of my blue group, which just now means it's going to move into the center of our group. Now that's all I'd like to configure for our text elements. 
The next thing I'd like to do is select back into my blue group. And within my layout tab, the first thing I'm gonna do is update the height of this element. I'm gonna set this to be zero which means that it's now going to collapse nicely around all of the text inside of this group itself. And then while we're in our layout tab, I'm going to update the container alignment for this particular group. So the container alignment just determines where all of the elements are going to be aligned inside of this blue group. And because this container layer is a row, this is just going to update the horizontal alignment. So do I want my text element to be positioned on the left, in the center or to the right? And in this case, it's going to be in the center. And so between updating the container alignment of the overall group to be centered, as well as when I updated the vertical alignment to be centered for this particular text element, this just means that this text is going to be centered across all axes at any given point in time. I will just click back into my blue group because I'd like to update the vertical alignment of where this group sits inside of my repeating group. And I'd like that to be centered. I'm also then just going to scroll on down to my margins here because I'm going to add in 10 pixels of margin at the top, 10 on the bottom. I won't add any on the left, but I'll also add in 10 pixels of margin on the right. And now you'll start to see the groups inside of our repeating group are going to be nicely spaced apart. However, at this point, we still have an influx of groups that have been added onto our page. And so in order to tidy those up, we're going to click on our overall repeating group here. And the first thing I'm going to do within my layout tab is just head to my container alignment option. And I'm going to center align all of the groups in the center of the repeating group cells. I'm then gonna come down to our height here. And theoretically, I could set the minimum height here to be zero. And what you'd think would happen is that this element would collapse around all of the elements inside of it, like it has done so far when we use these settings. However, when you're working with a horizontal repeating group, they can be a little bit tedious to find the correct height settings. And so if you're new to Bubble, this will definitely be a little bit confusing. I myself still find that I have to tinker around with the height settings to get the ideal height for my horizontal repeating groups. And so today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna set the minimum height to be 80, and I'm actually gonna set that this should be a fixed height, which just means that at any given point in time, this repeating group should be no higher than 80 pixels. And now the reason why I've selected 80 pixels today is because before I had recorded this tutorial, I played around with some of the height settings to see how much height I need to fit in my groups here. And as you'll see in a moment, 80 pixels is the ideal height. What I will need to do though, is jump over to my appearance tab. And just when you thought repeating groups were confusing enough as is, I'm gonna throw another layer of complexity at you. And that is that as I'd mentioned before, a repeating group is essentially a cluster of individual groups. So not only can you configure the overall width settings of your repeating group within the layout tab here, but you can also update the width settings of each individual group inside of your repeating group. And that's where you'll see the option here to have a minimum height on each of your rows. And now by default, that's set to be 100 pixels. But if I update this to be 80 pixels, what you'll soon see is that that's going to be the perfect amount of height we'll need in order to display each of our tags within our repeating group cells. Now, what I can still see is that each of our tags looks almost like a semicircle or a little diglet if you're a big Pokemon fan. One thing I have forgotten to do is actually select on the group itself, jump over into my layout tab, and also update the width settings to fit the width of this element to the content inside of it. And now when I select on that, it's going to expand out and display all of our text here. And of course, if this text element is smaller, it will contract. If it's longer, it will expand. And now to my point before, what you'll now see is that that 80 pixel mark that we've added onto our repeating group height is going to be the perfect amount to fit in each of these tags. And so what I'd love to do at this point is actually just show you a quick preview of how this is going to look on our homepage. But before I do that, I'm gonna make one last change and that is just add some margin around the sides of this repeating group. So right now I can see the repeating group is touching the borders of my page. So if I click on the repeating group, open up my layout tab and just add in 20 pixels of margin on the left and 20 pixels of margin on the right. This will just ensure that the repeating group doesn't touch the borders of my page. Let's now open up a preview of this page so you can see how this repeating group is going to function. So I'm just gonna hit the preview button here and over on my page, what you'll see is a list of all of the tags for each of the job categories. And now what you'll see is that if I was to reduce the width of my browser, 
what you'll see is that our repeating group tags will start to get cut off. However, because our repeating group is a horizontal scrolling repeating group, users will be able to scroll horizontally within this and still select whatever tag they would like. And so that's how we can add our first repeating group onto our home page. Now, as I mentioned, when it comes to repeating groups, working with horizontal scrolling repeating groups is much more difficult than just say a standard repeating group where a user scrolls from top to bottom. So please don't stress if this was a little bit overwhelming if you are brand new to Bubble. And I promise that most of the repeating groups we're gonna work with today are not going to be horizontal scrolling. So things are only gonna get easier from there. The very last thing I'd like to add onto our homepage from here though, is just going to be a list of the actual jobs that people have published onto our application. So if we open up WeWork remotely once again, you'll see that there's a list of jobs, which of course means we're gonna to have to add another repeating group onto our page. But unlike the repeating group we've just added, which was horizontal scrolling, I can see this one is vertical scrolling. So we're scrolling from top to bottom. Now this repeating group is relatively straightforward to add on. So let's jump back over into our bubble editor here. And now below our category repeating group, I'd like to just add in another title before I add in the repeating group of jobs. So in order to streamline the process of adding in that title, I'm just gonna select our existing title here, make a copy of that, and then drag it down further on our page. I'm then going to head to my appearance tab so I can update the text that's displayed within this element. And I'm just gonna have this display the words latest job opportunities. Then below this, I'm going to add in another repeating group element, only this time we're going to display a list of jobs. So under my containers, I'm going to add a repeating group onto my page. Now, similar to before, the first thing we'll need to do with this repeating group is just update the type of content we'd like to display. In this case, I'd like to display a list of all of the active jobs that have been posted on our application. So if I head to the type of content, I'd like to display a list of job posts. And now for the data source, what I'd like to do is just perform a search through my database for all of the job posts that are currently active. And so if I head to the data source, I can choose the do a search for option, and then I'll have the option to search through any data type in my database, which of course I'm gonna search through the job post data type. And for the job post I'd like to display, as I mentioned, I only wanna show the jobs that are currently active, not the jobs that have been marked as complete. So I'm gonna add a new constraint here, and I'm only going to display all of the job posts where the complete status currently equals no, which means that that job has not yet been filled. I'm then going to sort these by their creation date. So that way I can display the most recent job ads at the top. So if I scroll on down, I can sort these by the created date and I can set the descending value to be yes, which just means that it's going to display the most recent job posts at the top of our repeating group. And now that is all I'll need to add into our data source here. So I can choose to close this. And now at this point in time, what you'll see is that this repeating group displays a list of vertical cells, which is the exact experience we wanna to create today. However, one thing I should just point out is that right now this repeating group has a fixed number of rows. So you can see there's four rows here. Now let's say we have a hundred job posts that we wanna display on our homepage. Right now we're only able to display four of those whereas we actually want to display all of those. So what I'm gonna do is unselect that there should be a fixed number of rows. However, I will still keep this as a fixed number of columns because I'm only ever gonna to want to display one job on each line. And so I'm gonna keep this option ticked. Before I add any elements into this repeating group, I'm gonna to head to my layout tab here and I'll need to update the container layout for the elements I'm gonna add into this repeating group cell. And in this case, I'd like to display elements side by side, which means they're going to be horizontal. So I'm gonna set the container layout to be a row. I'm then going to update the responsive settings of this repeating group. So I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I will jump over to my minimum width and set that as zero, leaving my maximum width as infinite. So now this repeating group can be as small or as large as we'd like on our homepage. Now today, when it comes to this repeating group, I should just open up the example from WeWork remotely. But what you'll see within their platform is that within each job post, we've got a logo for a company, followed by the details of who the company is, what the job title is, as well as what type of role it is. So is it full-time, part-time, or even contract? And then we have the option to display these additional elements here, which can just notify that this is a new job post. And so we can easily replicate this whole experience today. But one thing I just wanted to point out is that this yellow rectangle here is essentially just a group inside of their overall repeating group. 
and inside of this yellow group, I can see that they're displaying four different elements side by side. So on the far left, we've got the image, then we have the text, followed by the additional text, and then even the icon. So what we're gonna do inside of our repeating group is add another group, and we're going to then add in each of these items that are going to be stacked horizontally. So if I jump back into Bubble, inside of our repeating group, I'm gonna add an additional group. Now, before I update any of the container layout or even the width settings of this group, I'm gonna to head to my appearance tab, and I'm gonna to choose to remove the style of this group because I'll update the background color to be a flat color. Now, while we're working on this group, I could set this to be, let's say, a light shade of yellow. By all means, when you go to preview or publish your application, you can change this to whatever color you would like. However, just while we're working inside of our editor, it's just going to allow me to see where this group sits. And throughout our tutorial today, you'll see me color code all of my groups, which actually makes it just look like a big Lego set by the time I finish building it. But it just helps me easily outline where all of my elements sit inside of my editor. Now for this group, I'm gonna jump over to my layout tab because I would now like to update the container layout. Now, as I mentioned inside of this group, I'm gonna be displaying elements side by side. So I'm gonna set the container layout to be a row. I'm then going to update the width of this to expand and take up all of the space within our repeating group. So I'm going to unselect that that should be a fixed width. I will like always set the minimum width is zero, leaving the maximum width is infinite. So it's gonna take up as little or as much space as it possibly can. Then I will come back and update the height of this element in a moment. But what I'd like to do is add in all of the elements I'd like to display within our repeating group. And then I'm gonna take the time to show how we can make this repeating group fully responsive. So the first element I'd like to add inside of our repeating group is just gonna be an image. And that's gonna be the logo of the company that's published this job ad. So if I head to my visual elements, I'd like to add an image element into my yellow group. And now because this image sits inside of a group that sits inside of my overall repeating group, similar to our example with the job categories, I'm gonna need to pass some data on through from my repeating group into my yellow group before I can then reference the value inside of this image. So if I just click on my yellow group here, I'm gonna update the type of content I'd like to store in this to be a job post. And I'd like to extract the data from the current cells job post. So that is the job that's being displayed in that particular cell of our repeating group. I can then click on my image. And if I insert dynamic data into this image, I'm gonna reference the parent group's job post, the company's logo, and now one personal preference I have when it comes to displaying images is that I like to select the more option and I'll often choose to process the image with Imgix, which just gives me an expanded list of editing features I can add onto this image. In this case, I just wanna tick this option to resize and fit the dimensions of this image by cropping it, which just means it's going to expand the image out and display it within this full image element. So it's just gonna look much cleaner. I'll choose to close this for now. I'll then head to the styling of this image and just remove the default style because I'd like to update the border of this to be 100 in terms of its roundness. So that way it will become a perfect circle in a moment. I'm then gonna jump over to my layout tab. And now when it comes to the width of this particular image element, I would like to keep this as a fixed width, meaning whatever value I add in here is going to be the definitive value that this image will be at any given point in time regardless of how small or large the page is. And I'm gonna update the width of this to be 60 pixels. And I'll also select this option here to keep this element's aspect ratio fixed. And if I keep this at a one-to-one -one ratio, that's gonna make it 60 pixels by 60 pixels. And I can see that I've accidentally set that as 50 pixels, not 60, so I'm just gonna update that there. But what you'll now see is that this image is 60 pixels by 60 pixels, that's perfect. While we're in our layout tab for this image, I'm also gonna vertically align this to be in the center of my yellow group here. So that way it's gonna be in line with all of the additional elements I add in. Now at this point in time, that's all I'm gonna change for our image, but we're not quite done with it yet. Later on, I'm gonna come back and show you how we can position it so it sits outside of our yellow group. But before I get to there, what I'd like to do is just add in all of the additional elements inside of our yellow group. And the next series of elements is going to be these text elements that sit on top of each other. Now, because our yellow group has the container layout of a row, any elements we add in are gonna be positioned side by side. So what we're actually gonna to need to do here is add in another group inside of my yellow group. And I'll need to set its container layout to be a column, which means I can stack those elements vertically. So from top to bottom. So if I jump back into bubble, 
I'm gonna head to my containers menu and I'm gonna add in yet another group inside of my yellow group. Now, when it comes to this group, as I mentioned, I'd like to set its container layout to be a column. Before I update any of its width settings though, I'm just gonna jump to my appearance tab and just remove the default style of this so I can set the background style to be a flat color. Now, while I'm working on this group, I could set the background color to be, let's say a light shade of blue. So that way I can actually just clearly see where it sits inside of my group. Again, when you go to preview or publish your app, you can remove this color if you'd like. But for the time being, I'm just gonna leave that as is. Now, before I update any of my additional width settings for this particular group, I'm gonna take the time to add all of the elements inside of this. So that is my three text elements. So if I head to my visual elements, I'm gonna grab a text element and add that into my blue group. And now when it comes to this text element, I'd like to start by displaying the company's name that has published this job post. But one thing I should point out is that because our text element sits within a blue group that sits within our yellow group, that of course sits within our repeating group, I'm gonna to need to continue passing data on through the chain of groups here. So if I select on my blue group, I'm gonna update the type of content to be a job post just like we'd done with our yellow group. Only this time, because our blue group sits within our yellow group, I'm gonna extract the data stored within my yellow group. And of course, that group is extracting data from our repeating group. So for the data source, I'm gonna set this to be the parent group's job post. Then for the text element, what you'll see is that when I insert dynamic data, I can easily reference and display the parent group's job post, the company who published that, their name. Then when it comes to the styling of this element, I'm gonna remove the default style. And the only change I'd like to make is that I wanna set the font size to be 16. I'll then jump over into my layout tab here because I'd like to update the responsive width settings for this element. So when it comes to most text elements, I'll always unselect that this should be a fixed width and I'll use my favorite settings, which is setting the minimum width as zero and leaving the maximum width as infinite. So now this text element here will be as small or as large as it possibly can be inside of our blue group. I'm then also gonna set the minimum height to be zero. And because we have the option selected to fit the height of this element to the content inside of it, it's going to collapse nicely around it there. The only other thing I'd like to do is just add in 20 pixels of margin at the top of this element. So that way it's not touching the border of my blue group. And then finally, the very last thing I'd like to change within the layout settings of this text element is that when it comes to the width of this text, I'd like to fit the width of this element to the actual text inside of it. And that'll just ensure that this text element doesn't push this group across to the side. Instead, I want it to collapse nicely around the text itself. Because when you think about it, company names aren't that long. They're normally one to three words. So it's not like this text element is gonna take up all of this space on our group. Instead, it's only gonna be relatively small. Below this though, what I'd like to do is add in another text element that is actually going to display the title of the job that has been created. So in order to streamline that process, I'm gonna make a copy of my existing text element. I'm gonna click in my blue group and paste this new version in. Only when it comes to this element, I'll jump to my appearance tab. And instead of displaying the parent group's job post, its company name, I'd like to display the role title that's been published. So this is the actual title of the job. I'm also then going to update the font size to be 18. I'll even choose to bold this text. And the last change I'll make is within my layout tab. Because I've already copied this element, I won't need to change any of the responsive settings again. All of that's been copied across. The only change I wanna make is just to the top margins. Instead of that being 20, I just want that to be 10. So that way there's not this big gap between these two text elements. Then finally, the last text element I'd like to add in is just the type of role that this is. So is it a full-time, part-time or contract role? And once again, in order to streamline the process of adding that text element in, I'm just going to select my first text element, make a copy of that, and I can move this to the last position within my blue group. If I jump to my appearance tab, I'm gonna have this display the parent group's job post, the role type. So if I scroll on down, I'll select the role type option. And because this is linked to our option set list, I'd like to select the display text for the option that this company has selected. I'm then going to once again, jump to my layout tab. And when it comes to the margin of this element, I'm going to set the top margin to be 10. And because this is the last element I'd like to add in my blue group, I'll also set a bottom margin of 20. I can then select on my overall blue group once I've finished adding all of my text elements inside of it. And I'm going to update the height of this to be zero, which means it's going to collapse nicely around all of the elements inside of it. 
I'm then going to vertically align this in the center of my overall yellow group here. And then from here, I'm also going to unselect that this element should be a fixed width. I'm gonna set the minimum width to be zero, leaving the maximum width is infinite. And so now this group is gonna take up as little or as much space as it possibly can. I'll then also scroll on down and just add in 20 pixels of margin to the left of this group, just so that way it doesn't touch the image of the company's logo. Now, after adding this group in, I'd like to add in yet another element beside this group within our overall yellow group. And in this instance, I'd like to display the date in which this job ad was published. And so all I'm gonna need to do is add a text element into my yellow group. So if I head on up to my visual elements, I can select to add a text element inside of this. I'm going to then head to my layout tab and move this to the next position within my yellow group, which is just going to position it at the end here. Now, before I update any of my layout settings, I'm gonna head to my appearance tab and just choose to insert the dynamic data I'd like to display within this element. And as I mentioned, I'd just like to display the date that this job ad was published on. So I'm gonna choose to insert dynamic data. And because this text element sits inside of our yellow group, I'm going to reference the parent group's job post. If I scroll on down to the bottom, you'll see the option to pull its creation date. So whenever something is created in your database, Bubble will automatically add a timestamp onto that. And that is known as its creation date. And so I'm also gonna to choose to format this as a custom option. And I'm just going to select the option here that is the month followed by the date and year. I'll then choose to close this. While we're working on the appearance tab here, I'm also gonna to choose to remove the style of this element because I'd like to update the font size of this to be 16. I'll then choose to jump over into my layout tab because when it comes to the responsive settings of this element, I'd like to unselect that this should be a fixed width. Now for this element, like always, I'm gonna set the minimum width to zero, leaving the maximum width here as infinite. So we can take up as little or as much space as it would like. I'm also gonna update the minimum height to be zero. So that way it will collapse nicely around the text inside of it. And then when it comes to the margins of this element, I'd also just like to add in 10 pixels of margin on the left and 10 on the right. And that's just going to ensure that it doesn't touch any of the additional elements inside of my yellow group. Finally, I'd also just like to update the vertical alignment of this text element to be in the center. So that way it's in line with all of my additional elements there. Now, the very last thing I'd like to add into this repeating group is just the tag that notifies someone if this is a newly published job ad. And so you'll see this little new tag here. And that's a relatively straightforward thing to create in Bubble. Essentially, we're just gonna add another group inside of our yellow group, followed by a text element inside of that. So if we jump back into our Bubble editor, I'm gonna head to my containers menu and choose to add a group into my existing yellow group. Now, before I make any changes to the layout settings of this group, I'm gonna jump to my appearance tab and I'm going to, like always, remove the style of this group because I'd like to set the background style to be a flat color. When it comes to this color, I'm gonna have this be the same blue color code that we've used for the hero section of our website, as well as the job categories. So I'm gonna set this to be 6B6BFF. I can then choose to jump over into my layout tab here. Now, as I mentioned, I'm only gonna add one element into this group, and that's just going to be a text element that displays the word new. So when it comes to the container layout, I can set this to be either the row or the column choice. However, I'm gonna select the row option here. Now, when it comes to the width of this group, I'm going to actually leave this as a fixed width just because I know for a fact how much space I want it to take up at any given point in time. So by default, this is gonna have a fixed width of 280 pixels, which is quite large. Whereas what I'd like to do is set this to be a fixed width of just 60 pixels. And the reason why I've selected this to be a fixed width is because as I mentioned, I'm only ever gonna want this to be 60 pixels at any given point in time. It's not like my text elements where I don't know how long the text is going to be. In this instance, I know for a fact that this should always just be 60 pixels in width. Now, before I update the height and the margin settings for this element, I'm gonna add the text element that's gonna sit inside of this. So under my visual elements, I'll select to add a text element into this group. Now I'm just gonna type in a static text option that displays the word new. I can then choose to remove the style of this because I'd like to update the font color to be white. I'll also then update the font size here to be 16 and I'll select to bold this font. 
I will also choose to center align this text in the center of the overall text element. Then I'll jump to my layout tab here. When it comes to the width of this element, like always, I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'll set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. So now it's gonna take up as little or as much space as it possibly can. I'll do the exact same thing for our height. So I'll set the minimum height as zero, meaning it will collapse around the text inside of it. I'll also vertically align this text element in the center of our blue group. And then finally, I'm gonna add in 10 pixels of margin around every single border for this text element. And that's all I'll need to change within our layout tab here. I can then select on our overall blue group that houses that element. Jump to my height settings and choose to set the minimum height as zero, which means it's now going to collapse around the text element inside of it. I'll vertically align this in the center of my yellow group. Then I'll also add in 20 pixels of margin on the right hand side. So that way it doesn't touch the border of my repeating group. And then finally, the very last thing I'd like to do is just add some curved edges in on this group here. So I'm gonna to head to my appearance tab for this group and I'm just gonna set the roundness at 10. So that way the edges become curved. And now at this point, you can start to see that our repeating group that contains all of the information for a job ad is coming together quite nicely. However, as I mentioned, I did wanna come back to the image element so we could create the same experience as we work remotely where the image sits outside of the yellow group. And so in order to create that experience, what we're gonna to need to do is first of all, select on our overall yellow group and open up our property editor. We're gonna to need to jump into our layout tab here. And the first thing I'd like to do within our layout tab is just update the minimum height to now be zero. So that way it's going to collapse around all of the elements that sit inside of the group itself. Then I'd also like to add in 10 pixels of margin at the top, 10 on the bottom, and then 30 on the left. And now the reason I've added 10 at the top and 10 on the bottom is so I can space out each of the job ads from one another. However, the reason I added 30 pixels of margin on the left hand side is because if I was to select on my image here, you might remember that it is currently set as a fixed width of 60 pixels. And now if I was to replicate the real world experience from WeWork remotely, what you'll see is that the center of this image sits right through the border of our overall group. And so when it comes to the margins of this image, what I'd like to do is move half of the image so it's outside of our yellow group. And so half of 60 is going to be 30. And so if I set the left margin to be minus 30 here, what you'll see is that half of that image is gonna be moved outside of the group, which just meant that I needed 30 pixels of margin for my yellow group to actually fit this image outside of it there. And that's everything I'd like to add into my repeating group here. However, there's still just quite a few changes we'll need to make to this in order to make this page fully functional. And the first is that I'd like to now select on my overall repeating group. So this is my repeating group job post. And because I finished adding all of my elements inside of this repeating group, I'd like to collapse its height because at this point in time, I can see we've got a ton of excess height here that we're not using. So we're gonna set the minimum height of this element to be zero. And that's now going to collapse nicely around the yellow group inside of the repeating group itself. Now, although you can only see one cell here, this repeating group is going to display an infinite amount of job posts. So if you have a hundred you need to display, it will display 100 and a user can just continually scroll down and load more. While we're within our layout tab, I'd also just like to add some margin around our repeating group itself. So I'm gonna add in 20 pixels of margin at the top, 20 on the bottom, 20 on the left and 20 on the right. And that's just going to ensure that it doesn't touch any of the borders of my page. And now at this point, you can really start to see our home page come together. And that is of course, until we head over into our responsive tab here. So on a desktop device, this job ad is gonna look great. It's gonna be able to display all of the information we have added into our repeating group. However, as we reduce the size of our browser here, what you'll see is that all of these text elements are going to be bunched together. And so right now this isn't looking too great at all, but of course it is my job to save the day here and teach you how we can make this repeating group fully responsive. So I can see as we reduce the width of our page, there's two elements here that are going to take up a lot of additional space that we won't need. In my opinion, the two most important things to display within the job ad is first of all, the company logo, as well as the information about the job itself. And so what I'm gonna do is just choose to hide the text element that displays the date, as well as the new tag, whenever the page becomes smaller than a certain width. And so if I was to just reduce the width of my page here, 
I can see that it's around the 700 pixel mark where things start to get quite congested in our overall yellow group. And so thankfully within Bubble, what you can do is choose to hide and display elements based on the actual width of a user's browser. So if I was to select on my date text here, so this is the text that displays the creation date of this job ad. What I can do is actually head over into my conditional tab and I can choose to define a condition. Now, if you're new to Bubble and you haven't used conditions before, they're a great way to change the behavior of your elements whenever a certain pattern occurs. And so in this case, I just wanna type in the word width and I'd like to recognize when the current page width is smaller than 700 pixels, what I'd like to do is select that this element should be visible and not tick that that is true, meaning this element will be hidden. Now, if I was to reduce the width of my browser below 700 pixels, as you can see, this text element is no longer visible, but as you can see, it still takes up all of this space in my yellow group. And so if I was to head to my layout tab, what I can also do is tick this option to collapse this element when it's hidden which just means that when it's not being displayed, it's no longer going to take up any space on my page. And now I'm gonna do the exact same thing for my new tag here. So I'm gonna click on this. I'm gonna to head to my conditional tab and I'm going to type in the word width and just recognize when the current page width is smaller than 700 pixels, I'm gonna select that this element is visible and not tick that that should be true. I'll then jump over to my layout tab and select to collapse this element when it's hidden. And so now what you'll see is that as our page reduces in size, the only information we're going to be displaying is the information critical to the company that's hiring as well as the role title. And that is how we can create a fully responsive experience across any device size. And now at this point, we're almost done, but we're not quite there. There's two additional things I'd just like to cover. And the first is related to the new tag that we've added into our job ad here. So obviously whenever someone creates a new job ad, I'd like to display this little new tag. However, after a certain period of time that this job has been active for, I no longer will want to display this new tag on it because that job just won't be new anymore. And so what I can do is just create another condition and just recognize whenever a job ad is a certain number of days old, I can just remove this new tag. And so if I click on this new tag here, what I can do is head over to my conditional tab. And if I really wanted, before I do that, I could even update the name of this tag. So that way later on, if I ever need to reference it, I can easily identify what it's called. And so if you ever wanna update the name of an element within Bubble, just head up to your property editor where you can see the name and you can just choose to remove this and add in your own custom name. So I'm gonna call this group new tag. Now within the conditional tab, I'm going to define another condition. And within this condition, I'd just like to recognize when this job has been published more than 10 days ago, I won't want this tag to be displayed. And so in order to calculate how many days ago this job ad was published, what I can do is choose to reference the current date time. So if I just type in the word date, you'll see the option to reference the current date time. Then what I can do is scroll on down and choose to subtract from that the date in which this job ad was published. So I'm gonna reference the parent group's job post, its creation date. So if I scroll on down, I'll see the option to select the creation date. And when the number of days between these two dates, so I'm gonna format this as days, is now greater than 10 days, I'm going to select that this element is visible and not tick that that should be true. And now that just means that this tag here is going to be hidden after 10 days. Now, the very last thing I'd like to do when it comes to our overall page is just restrict how much width this yellow group can take up. So at this point in time, what you'll see is that as I expand my page out, this particular yellow group becomes quite elongated. So it's just quite long and there's not really much information that we're gonna be displaying in this. So it doesn't actually need to be this long. So what I can do is double click on my yellow group, head to my layout tab. And if you remember at this point in time, we have a minimum width on this group of zero and a maximum width is infinite. So rightfully, it is taking up as little or as much space as it possibly can on our page. But what I'd like to do is just add a maximum width of let's say 1000 pixels, which just means that regardless of our page size, this yellow group is going to be no longer than this particular size here. Of course, because its minimum width is still zero, it will in fact reduce in size. But just when it comes to the maximum, it's not gonna be any longer than this. 
And now at this point, that is absolutely everything I wanted to cover within this section of our tutorial. We've definitely been building for quite some time here and you can start to see that our homepage is actually coming together quite nicely. Of course, if you were to take a preview of this page right now, you wouldn't see anything within this repeating group. And that is because this repeating group is displaying a list of job posts and we haven't yet created any job posts in our database. So right now it would have no data to display. But of course, once we built out that feature, you'll start to see it populate with job posts, which will be super exciting to see. What I would just like to do though, is just jump back into my Notion checklist. And I'm just going to check off that we're finished building out all of the features to create the framework of our homepage. And as I mentioned, this was quite a big module, but I just wanted to start with a bang and build out most of the framework for our homepage. And so that way within the upcoming modules, we can start to dive in and make everything functional. While we're building out the homepage, the next thing I just wanted to quickly cover is how we can build out a navigation experience within our application, which is just going to allow users to navigate between all of the different pages we're gonna create in our app today. And within this navigation menu, it's also gonna be used to allow someone to create an account or even log into an existing account. Now, thankfully, this is a relatively straightforward process to build out. So we're just gonna jump over into our bubble editor here. Now within our application, we're gonna open up our index page, which is the home page we had previously built out before. And as you'll remember, at the top of our page, we have this hero section, which just displays some headings. But of course, above that, I'd like to add our navigation menu. Now, when it comes to creating a navigation menu, this is going to be an element that we're going to use across every single page within our application today. And so instead of having to build this out across each individual page, what I'd like to do is create some sort of way to be able to build this element once and then reuse it across every page to save me having to manually build it from scratch each individual time. And thankfully there is actually an element that allows you to do that. And it is known in bubble as a reusable element. So if you're not familiar with reusable elements, they are exactly as the name would suggest. It allows you to build an element once in which you can then display it across any page within your application. And the best use case for reusable elements is building navigation menus. Now, in order to create a reusable element, you don't actually do this on your bubble page. Instead, you head up to your page dropdown menu in the top left-hand corner. And right down the bottom, you'll see an option to add a new reusable element into your application. We're gonna click on this here, and I'm gonna call this header navigation menu. I'm then gonna choose to create this from scratch. And now what you'll see is that when it comes to building this reusable element, we've been redirected to almost like another page within our application where we can construct this element before we then add this element onto our main page. Now, if I was to double click on this element here, what you'll see is that when it comes to a reusable element, we can choose what type of element this should be. So we have the option to choose from a group, a pop-up, or even a floating group, which we'll get to those later on. But for this reusable element, I'm gonna keep this as the default option to be a group. So essentially, I'm gonna to want to add a group to the top of every single page. And within that group, I'm going to set the container layout to be horizontal, which means I'm going to display a list of elements side by side, which is similar to the navigation menu on any website. So as you can see, there's normally a logo in the left-hand corner. Then on the right-hand side, you'll often have menus as well as buttons that users can click. And so in order to create that experience, as I said, I'm gonna leave the type of element to be a group. I'm then going to jump over into our layout tab and update the container layout to be a row because I'll be displaying elements horizontally within this group. Now, when it comes to the width of this group, you'll see here that the width of our UI builder is set as 200. What I'd like to do is set this to be 960. Now, this by all means isn't the definitive width of this group. Instead, this is just the width that's going to be displayed for this group inside of our bubble editor here, which is also known as your UI builder. So you'll also see we have the option to set a minimum and maximum width on this group. So that just means that right now, if I was to jump to my responsive tab here, this group is in fact fully responsive across any page size. But just for the sake of while we're building this element, it's going to be displayed as 960 pixels in width. And the reason why I selected 960 is because that is just enough space to work with here. And it can also be the size of a small desktop device or even something like an iPad. But by all means, it's not the end of the world if you wanna set that to be any different size. 
What I would like to do now within my group is start adding in the elements I'd like to display. So on the top left hand corner, I'm going to add in a logo for my job board. Now, by all means, you could upload a custom image if you would like, but I'm just going to keep things simple in our tutorial today by adding in a custom icon. So if I head to my visual elements, I'm going to choose to add an icon element into my group. And for this icon, I'm just going to select this to be a paper plane just because that seems indie enough to be a logo for a job board. Now, when it comes to this icon, what I'd like to do is also update the color of this. And instead of removing the style, what I'm gonna do is choose to actually edit the default style. Now, the reason I'm choosing to edit the style instead of just removing this and creating a one-off color for this particular icon is because if I use any other icons across my application, Instead of having to update the color to be this exact same color current I'm about to paste in, what I can do is change it once under our standard icon style. And then if I ever want to reference that color, I can just select to choose from our standard icon style. So styles are almost like reusable elements, but only for the different design styles within elements. So I'm going to choose to edit the style of this. For our primary color, I'm gonna set this to be the same blue color code we'd used for the hero section of our homepage. If you'd like that color code again, it's 6B6BFF. And that's all I'll need to change here. If I jump back into my design tab, what you'll see is that because this icon uses the standard icon style, its color has now also been updated. From here, I'll then jump to my layout tab because I'd like to update the size of this icon. And for this icon, I'd like to update the width to be 40 pixels as well as the height to be 40 pixels. And I'm going to leave these both as fixed values because I would like this icon to only ever be 40 by 40. I don't want it to be any larger or any smaller based on the size of our page. I'm going to also then vertically align this in the center of our overall navigation menu. And then finally add in 20 pixels of margin at the top, 20 on the bottom and 20 on the left. Although I won't add in any on the right. Now on the other side of my group element, I'd like to add two buttons side by side. One is going to be a button to log a user into an account and the other is going to be a button to publish a new job post. Now because I want my logo to be fixed on the left hand side of my group and my buttons to be positioned on the right, what I'm going to need to do is add a group within my existing group so I can cluster those two buttons together and then move those both to the right hand side of this reusable element. And so if I scroll them down to my containers, I'm going to choose to add a group inside of my existing group here. Now, when it comes to the appearance of this group, I'm just going to temporarily remove the style of this and give it a flat background color. I can make this, let's say a light shade of red, just so I can easily depict where this is going to be within my overall reusable element. I'll then jump to my layout tab and I'm going to set the container layout of this group to be a row because I'm going to add two buttons into this and they're going to be positioned side by side. So if they're positioned horizontally, that means my container layout will need to be a row. I'm then going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'm going to set the minimum width as zero for now, leaving the maximum width as infinite. Now I will come back later on to update all of these settings within this group. But before I do that, what I'd like to do is add my two button elements into this group. So I'm going to scroll on up to my visual elements and I'm going to add my first button in. And this is just going to display the word login. Now for this button, I'd also like to update the style of this. And instead of removing the style, I'm going to once again edit this existing style because I'm going to want to reuse this style once again later on throughout my application. And so to save me the time of having to change the style every single time I want it to look a certain way, I could just edit the style once and reference that at any point that I would like. So I'm going to choose to edit the style here. And when it comes to the styling of this, I'm just going to update the color of the background to be that same shade of blue. So the color code is 6B6BFF. That's all I'm going to change here. I'll jump back into my design tab and then I'm going to make a copy of this button. Only this time when it comes to this button, I'll have this display the words post a job. And for this button, I'd like to also create a different design style. So I want this button to be the inverse option of this current style we've used for our login button. So instead of using the primary button style, what I'm going to do is create a new style and I'm going to call this secondary button. I'll choose to create this here. Then I can choose to edit this style. And instead of the background color being this shade of blue, I'm going to actually set the font color to be that shade of blue. I'll then set the background color to be white. 
And I'd just like to add a solid border around this particular button. And I want that border's color code to be the same shade of blue that I've used here. And this of course is the same color code from the previous button we had used, which is 6B6BFF. If I then jump back into my design tab, what you'll see is that this button is now the inverse of our first button we've added. Now, one thing I should point out is that when it comes to both of these buttons here, if I jump to my layout tab, these buttons currently have a fixed width of 150 pixels, which I'm actually quite happy to leave as the default option. So that just means that regardless of the page size, these buttons are always going to be 150 pixels in width. They're also going to be 45 pixels in height. And the only margin I'm going to add is to my login button. In this case, I'm just going to add in 10 pixels of margin on the right hand side. So that way it doesn't touch the button that sits beside it there. And that's all of the elements I'd like to add into my red group. So what I'm going to do is click on this red group. I'm going to head to my layout tab. I'm going to start by setting the minimum height to be zero which of course means it's going to collapse around all of the buttons that sit inside of it. I'm then going to also vertically align this element in the center of my navigation menu. But what you'll currently see is that I have all of this empty space on the right hand side of this element. And that's because our group has an infinite max width. So it's trying to take up as much space as it possibly can within our page. And so what I can do is select this option to fit the width of this element to the content inside of it. And now it's going to collapse horizontally around both of those buttons there. So now you'll see that looks neat and tidy. Finally, I'm going to need to obviously create a way to move all of these buttons over to the right hand side of this group, whilst also maintaining our icon or our logo on the left hand side. And the way I can do that is by selecting on our overall group. So this is our reusable element itself. Now you may remember before in our previous module, I'd mentioned that when you set the container layout of a group to be a row, you have the option to update the horizontal alignment of the elements inside of it. Now by default, all of these elements are going to be aligned to the left, but if you wanted to center them, you could put them in the center. Today, what I'm actually interested in doing is selecting the space between option, which just means that these elements are going to have an even amount of space between them, and they're gonna be pushed to the sides of our group. So now you'll see that they sit on either side of our reusable element. One thing I will just need to do is click on my red group and just add in some margin on the right hand side. So that way it doesn't touch the borders of my overall group. So if I just scroll on down, I'm going to add in a right margin of 20, which is the same margin we've added to the left hand side of our paper plane icon. While we're also adding margins onto our red group, I could, if I wanted, also add in 20 pixels of margin at the top and 20 pixels of margin on the bottom. And what that's going to do is just ensure that when I collapse the height of this reusable element, so this white group, that it doesn't touch the borders of this group itself. So I'm going to now click on my overall reusable element, so my header navigation menu. Now for the minimum height, I can currently see that this is set as 200. What I'm going to want to do is remove that and set that as zero, so that way it collapses around all of the elements inside of it. And as you'll now see, our navigation menu is starting to take shape. What I would just like to do within this navigation menu before I update any additional responsive design settings is just create some of the workflows that are going to run whenever these elements are clicked within it. Because as I mentioned, the purpose of this element is to help users navigate between the different pages in our application. And so every single time this paper plane icon is clicked, what I'd like to do is redirect someone through to the home page of our app, which is known as our index page. And so what I can do is head to my appearance tab and I can choose to start a workflow whenever this element is clicked. And within this workflow, as I mentioned, I'm just going to want to send someone through to our index page, which is our home page. So this is a relatively straightforward workflow. In my navigation events, I can select the go to page action and I can easily just select that the destination page that someone should be sent to whenever they click this icon is going to be our index page. It's literally as simple as that. If I then jump over to our design tab, we could build out some workflows for our additional buttons here, but I'm going to save those for the relevant modules whenever we create the registration feature, as well as the ability to post an actual job. But now before we go ahead and add this header navigation menu onto our homepage, there's one last thing I'll need to do, and that is just update some of the additional responsive settings for our elements here. So if I was to jump into our responsive tab here, what you'll see is that on a large device, this menu looks great because there's plenty of space between our elements. But if I start reducing the width of the screen here, what you'll see is that these elements are eventually going to collide and they're going to stack on top of each other. 
And that's actually not the experience I'd like to create. I'd always like these elements to be positioned side by side, so horizontally across our menu. And so what I can do, similar to our previous module, is just create some conditions that just recognize when the page width is below a certain amount of pixels, and I can update the behavior of these elements. So in theory, I could update the width of, let's say, this group element, or even the margin of this icon, just so that way they don't need to collapse on top of each other. What I'd like to do is instead have enough room for them to be both side by side. And so what I'm gonna do is start by selecting on my icon element here. I'm gonna to head to my conditional tab and I'm gonna define a new condition. And within this condition, what I'd like to do is just recognize when the current page width, so I'm gonna type in the word width, and when the current page width is smaller than, and in this case, I'm just gonna say 400 pixels, because that is the point where these elements will almost start to collide. What I'd like to do is update the left margin of this icon. So I'm gonna type in the word left, select the left margin. And instead of having a left margin of 20, I'd just like this to have a left margin of 10, which just means that it's gonna take up 10 less pixels on our page, whilst also having some space between the border of the page. And now, as you can see at this point, we're at 387 pixels. But what we really want to factor for is at the 320 pixel mark, because that is the smallest possible device size that someone could be viewing our application on. So that's something like an iPhone 5. So if I click on 320 pixels, this is what our page is going to currently look like. And so it's still not an optimal experience. And so what I'm actually going to do is click on our login button here. Now with this login button, because we're only displaying one word, this button doesn't always need to be this big. So if you remember, in our layout tab, this button had a fixed width of 150 pixels, which just means that at all given times, this button is going to be this exact size. However, what we could do is create a condition that just recognizes when our page is below a certain width, I could update the actual fixed width of this button, so that way it could take up less space. And so if I head to my condition tab, I'm going to once again define a condition. I'm gonna type in the word width, and I'm gonna recognize when the current page width is once again less than 400 pixels. What I'm gonna do is choose to update the width of this button, and I'm just gonna set the width to not be 150 pixels, but instead just be 100 pixels. And now at this point, you can start to see that we almost have enough space to display all of our elements in one line. The very last thing I could do is perhaps select on our second button here and create the exact same condition. So I'm just gonna recognize when the current page width is less than 400 pixels, what I'd like to do is update the width of this button. And instead of setting that to be 100 pixels, I might set this to be 130 pixels. And the reason I'm doing that is because there are a few additional words within this button here. So it will need more space. But as you can see, at the 320 pixel mark, we now have room to display all of our elements inside of our navigation menu. And if I was to expand this page out past 400 pixels, what you'll see is that all of these elements are going to revert to their original sizes. And if I was to collapse the menu, all of these are going to update accordingly. Now that's everything we'll need to add into our reusable header menu here. Now it's time to go and add this into our actual homepage itself. So if I just jump back to my UI builder, select on my page dropdown menu and head over to my index page. What I'd like to do is now add this reusable element onto my page. And the way in which I can do that is by first of all, just moving my head out of the way here. I can then scroll on down to the option to add in a reusable element. And this is where you'll see our header navigation menu. Now I can choose to add this anywhere on my page. And what you'll see is that it's going to add the entirety of this element directly onto our page. Now I am gonna to wanna to drag that to the top of our page just because it is our header menu. And now one thing I should point out is that with our header menu here, because it is a reusable element, you won't actually be able to make any changes to this element on any page. If you wanna make changes to it, you're gonna to need to head back to your reusable element and any changes you make here will automatically be reflected across any page. And so that is the benefit of using a reusable element. You only need to build it once and any changes will automatically be applied across any page where you reference that element. And look, it'll really start to save you time when you build out all of the workflows to power our navigation menu. Instead of having to create these workflows on every single page, all you have to do is create them within your reusable element and then they'll run on any page. Jumping back into my Notion checklist from here, 
I'm just going to tick off that we finished building out the navigation menu within our app today. Now within that, I of course explained how we could create a reusable element, but also how we could update the responsive settings of the buttons and even the icon within our element, just so that way we had a fully responsive experience across any device size, whether it be mobile or desktop. Moving down through the list of features I have set out in my Notion checklist here, I actually just wanted to jump ahead to the feature where we're going to learn how we can publish a job listing. And just for the sake of our YouTube tutorial today, I wanted to skip ahead to this because I think this is one of the most important features we're going to cover within our build. There is quite a bit involved within this particular module and it's by far one of the biggest sections of our tutorial that we're going to cover today. Now I'm actually going to break this down into two different sections. The first section we're going to cover right now is actually how we can store all of the information we need to publish within a job ad. So this is information like the job description, the job title, as well as information about the company. So what the company's name is, the company overview, as well as their brand logo and so on. And then within the second section of this particular feature, I'm going to walk us through how we can create the workflow to actually publish this job listing within our database and of course across our platform. And within that, I'm also going to explain how you can process payments using Stripe. So that way you can charge companies whenever they want to publish a new job ad. But when it comes to actually building out the user interface where companies will be able to list all of the details of their job ad, what we're going to do is jump over into our bubble editor. Now you may remember that in our navigation menu at the top of our page, we had a button in this which prompts someone to post a new job. What I'd like to do is first of all, create a workflow that's going to run whenever someone clicks on this button and I'm going to redirect them through to a dedicated page where they can in fact post a new job. So I'm going to open up my page drop down menu here and I'm going to head over to my header navigation menu, which is my reusable element. I'm then going to double click on my button and open up the property editor. And from here, I'm going to click on the start workflow button. Now within this workflow, it's going to be pretty straightforward. I'm just going to create a navigation event and we're going to send someone through to a new page we'll build in our app. So I'm going to head to the navigation events, select the go to page action. Now at this point in time, the destination page does not yet exist. So we're going to create a new page from scratch and I'm going to call this page post because this is where someone's going to be able to post a job ad. I'll choose to create this. I can then set the destination page to in fact be that new post page. Now from here, I'm going to once again, head up to my page drop down menu and I'm going to now open up my post page that we've just created. And at this point in time, this page should in fact be blank. There should be nothing on it. Now, when it comes to building out a page from scratch, there's two things I'll need to do before I can start adding elements onto this. The first thing is of course, just update the background color. And again, this is just a purely personal preference of mine, but it just allows me to actually see where this page sits within my overall bubble editor. So I'm just gonna make this a light shade of gray. Of course, you can revert the color back to white when you go to preview or publish your application. But just for the time being, this is going to help us map out where we can actually build. And then of course, from here, the next thing we'll need to do is jump over into our layout tab because we'll need to set the container layout of this page. Now, like always, when you're working with a page, we're going to stack elements from top to bottom. So I'm going to set the container layout to be the column option. And of course, that will allow us to stack things vertically. From here, I'm then going to be able to add my elements onto the page. And the very first element I'd like to add is just going to be my header menu. And so because we've created that as a reusable element, we can simply just head on down to our reusable elements here and add my header menu onto the page. And it is as simple as that. We don't need to change anything else. Then below this header menu, I'd like to add a text element onto my page, which is going to be like a heading for this page. So I'm going to scroll on up to my visual elements. I will select to add a text element onto the page. And when it comes to this text element, I just like to update the text to display something like reach the largest community of startup job seekers. And this is just going to be a little prompt that just reminds someone of where they're going to be publishing their job ad. Now, when it comes to this text, I'm going to remove the style of this just because I'd like to add a few custom options. The first thing I'd like to do is just update the font size to be 22. So I'm going to make it a little bit larger. I'm also going to center align the text within the element itself. And then I'm also going to choose to bold this text. 
I'll then need to jump over into my layout tab because of course I'll need to make this element fully responsive across my page. Now, like always, when it comes to a text element, I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'm going to then set the minimum width is zero, leaving the maximum width is infinite. So that way this element can be as small or as large as it can possibly be on our page. I'm also gonna set the minimum height to be zero. And because the default option is selected to fit the height of this element to the content within it, it's going to collapse around that text nicely. Then finally for this text element, I'm just gonna add some margin so that way it doesn't touch the navigation menu or the borders of my page. I'm gonna add in 30 pixels of margin at the top, 20 on the left and 20 on the right there. And now below this, we can start creating the fields which are going to allow someone to add in the details about the job ad they would like to publish. Now, when it comes to the whole process of publishing a job, I'm actually gonna break this down into three different stages. So within the first stage, I want someone to be able to add in all of the details about a job, as well as the details about the company that's hiring for that job. In stage two, I would then like to display a preview of the job ad. And then in stage three, we're going to process a payment and then create that job in our database. And so in order to start breaking these down into different stages, I'm gonna head over to my visual elements and I'm going to start by adding a text element onto my page. And within this text element, I'm just going to identify that this is step one and this is going to be the creation process. So this is the stage where someone can create the job ad itself. Now, when it comes to this text, I'm just going to remove the style of this because I'd like to once again bold this text and also update the font size to be 20. I'm not gonna center align this, but I am gonna jump over into my layout tab because of course I'll need to make this text element fully responsive. I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. Like always, set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. I'll set the minimum height to be zero as well. And then finally add in 30 pixels of margin at the top, 20 on the left and 20 on the right. Now below this, I'm gonna add in a series of input fields which will allow the recruiter or a company to list all of the details about the job ad that they would like to publish. And I'm actually going to add all of these details inside a group just so I can make things neat and tidy. So I'm going to head to my containers menu here and add a group element onto my page. Now before I make any changes to this group, the first thing I'd like to do is just update the name of this. And the reason I'm doing that is because this group is not always gonna be visible on our page. Eventually, I'm gonna create an experience that only allows it to be displayed when we're in step one of our job creation process. But after someone adds all of the details in and they wanna view a preview of their job ad, I'm gonna to want to hide all of the inputs in this group. And so by giving this group a name, I can easily classify where it is within my element tree later on. So I'm just gonna call this group step one job details and I'm also just going to jump over into my appearance tab here I will remove the style of this group and give it a flat background color and I'm happy to keep that as white then while I'm here I'm also going to set the roundness of its borders to be 20 so that way it has some curved edges and then finally I can jump over to my layout tab and before I update any of the responsive settings I'm going to need to set a container layout for this group now inside of this group as I mentioned I'm just going to be displaying a series of input fields and these are going to be stacked from top to bottom. So I'm gonna set the container layout to be a column because we're stacking elements vertically. I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width, set the minimum width as zero, so that way this group can be as small or as large as it wants or across our page. I will come back and update the height and the margin in a moment, but before I do that, I'm gonna to need to add in all of my elements inside of this group, and there definitely are quite a few. The first element I'd like to add into this group is actually just going to be a heading. And in order to streamline the process of adding this heading in, I'm actually going to select the existing heading on our page. I'm gonna make a copy of this. I'm then going to click in my white group and paste a version of that in. Then when it comes to this heading, I'm just going to head over to my appearance tab. And I just like this to display the words position details, which will just highlight to someone that within this group, this is where they're going to add in all of the details of the job that they'd like to publish the ad for. Now I'm also going to want to update the color of this. I'm gonna set the color code to be the same shade of blue that I've used on things like my buttons. And if you'd like that color code once again, it's 6B6BFF. And that's all I'll need to change for my heading. I won't need to update any of the layout settings because I've copied this from another element that has already been updated. Below this, I would like to add in yet another text element though. 
So I'm going to scroll on up to my visual elements and add in a new text element from scratch. And I'm gonna have this text element display the word job title. And so below this text element, I'm gonna add an input field that allows someone to add in the title of the job that they wanna publish an ad for. And so this heading here is just going to notify to the user that that is the field where they would need to add the job title into. Now, when it comes to this text element, I'm just going to remove the style of this here because I'd like to bold this text. And that's the only change I wanna to make to my styling. I will, however, jump over into my layout tab here and I'd like to unselect that this element should be a fixed width. So I'm gonna update the responsive settings. Of course, like always, I'm gonna set the minimum width here to be zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. I'd also like to set the minimum height to be zero, so that way it collapses around the text. And then finally, when it comes to the margins for this element, I'm gonna add in 20 pixels of margin at the top, 20 on the left and 20 on the right. Now below this text element, as I mentioned, I'd like to add in our first input field, which is just going to allow the company or recruiter to add in the job title for the position they'd like to advertise for. So I'm gonna scroll on down to our input forms and just add in a standard input field. And before I make any changes to this input field, what I'd like to do is update the name of this. So that way when I create my workflow later on to actually publish my job ad, I can easily reference the data stored within the correct field. So I'm gonna call this input job title and I'm going to then jump over into my layout tab because of course I'll also need to update the responsive settings of this input field. So like always, I will unselect that this should be a fixed width. As you probably guessed, the minimum width will be zero. The maximum width will be infinite. However, when it comes to the height of this input field, I'm gonna keep this as a fixed value. And the reason I'm doing that is because the user is only gonna need one line to add in the job title. It's not gonna be a field with long form text. So this element doesn't need to expand downwards to add all of that text in. However, I will just set the height of this to be 45. And again, this is just a purely personal preference of mine. You don't need to change that if you didn't want. But the only other thing I will change is just the margins for this input field. I'm just gonna add in 15 pixels of margin on the left and 15 pixels of margin on the right. And that is everything I'd like to change for this input field here. The next thing I'd like to do is add in yet another input, only this time it's going to be a drop down menu. And that drop down menu is just going to be used to allow the recruiter or company to select the relevant category for this job post. So before I add in that input field, what I'd like to do is just make a copy of this heading. I'm going to move this to the next position within our group. And when it comes to this text, what I'd like to do is just update this to display the word category. And of course, because I'm making a copy of our existing text element, it's going to copy across all of the styling and the margins, so I won't need to make any changes there. Below this, as I mentioned, I'd like to add in a drop-down menu that just allows someone to select what type of category this job ad is relevant to. So I'm gonna scroll on down to my input forms, and you'll see the option to add in a drop-down menu here. And now a drop-down menu allows you to display a list of choices within a drop-down field. The name's pretty self-explanatory. However, what you'll find with the drop-down menu is that you can choose to either add in a list of static choices that you manually type in, so if you really wanted, you could manually type in all of the different job categories yourself, but why retype those when we've already created those job categories in our database? So if you remember, if I was to open up my data tab here and head over to my option sets, we've already added in a list of all of the job categories within our option sets here. So these are things like development, design, marketing, and so on. And so because we've already created these as a list of option sets, we can easily reference those within our drop-down menu. So if I jump over back to my design tab, one thing I should point out is that although you can add in a list of static choices that you manually type within this drop-down menu, what you'll also see is you have the ability to reference a list of dynamic choices. And dynamic choices are of course data stored within your database or even somewhere else in your application. And so what you can now do is link this to that relevant option set list that we've already created. So for the type of choices, what I'd like to do is reference the job category option set that we've created. And I'd like to display all of the job categories within this list. And of course, now that we've set a data source, the drop-down menu will just need to know what text to display for each option. And so I'm gonna display the current option, so the current job category, its display text, which is just the title of the job category itself. And that's all we'll need to configure. 
The one other thing I will need to do is of course just update the name of this input element so that way when I create my workflow later on, I know exactly which input field to reference. So I'm just gonna call this dropdown job category. I'm then going to jump over into my layout tab here because I'd like to update the responsive settings of this element. Now at this point in time, this element has a fixed width of 250 pixels, which just means that regardless of the page size, this element is going to be exactly this size here. And now while I'm quite happy with the width of this drop-down menu, right now it's currently not completely responsive. So if I was to just reduce the width of my browser, what you'll see is that the drop-down menu will start to get cut off. And that's because it always wants to be 250 pixels. And I mean, theoretically, this shouldn't be a problem because your app itself shouldn't go below 320 pixels in width on the smallest possible device. But if I did just wanna make this element fully responsive, the way I could do that is by unselecting that it should be a fixed width. And I could set the minimum width as zero, but instead leave the maximum width as 250 pixels, which just means that this element could go as small as it possibly can. However, it can't go any wider than 250 pixels. So if I was to reduce the width of my page, what you'll now see is that this drop-down menu will continually reduce with the size of it. And while we're here, the only other thing I'd like to change is just the height of this element. And look, the height is fixed at 48 pixels, which doesn't look too bad. But again, a personal preference of mine is that I'm going to fix that at 45 pixels. So that way it is the same height as the input field above it there. And then of course, the last change I'll need to make is the margins on this particular dropdown. I'm going to set the left margin at 15 pixels and the right margin at 15 pixels. So that way it is in line with the input field that sits above it there. I'm just gonna jump back into my UI builder here because I'd now like to add in yet a, another dropdown menu below our existing one here. And that dropdown menu is going to be used to select the type of role that someone is advertising for. So is it a full-time position, is it part-time, or is it even just a contract position? And so in order to streamline the process of adding this field in, I'm going to select the title as well as the dropdown menu. I'm going to make a copy of these. I'll then click on my white group here and paste in a version of those. I'm just gonna need to move my new text element below our existing dropdown menu there. I'll open up the property editor for this text element and I'll have this just display the words job type. Then if I head on down to the dropdown menu itself, the first thing I'm gonna do is update the name of this. I'm gonna call this dropdown job type. Now, if you also remember in our option set list in our data tab here, we had already created a list of job types. So we've got part-time, full-time or contract. And so similar to our previous drop-down menu that we've just added, we can easily reference this list dynamically. So I'm gonna jump over into my design tab here. And when it comes to the configurations for this drop-down menu, I'm going to update the type of choices to reference the job type option set. I'm going to then reference all of the job types within that list. And I'll just display the current options display text. So the title of each option. And that's all we'll need to configure here. And now because when we created this drop-down menu, we had copied our existing one, all of the layout settings have copied across with it. So we won't need to make any changes to the responsive design settings. Now below this drop-down menu, what I'd like to do is add in another input field that's going to allow the recruiter or company to add in the full details about a jobs position. So this is kind of like the position description. Now, when it comes to the input field I wanna use, in theory, the user is going to add in quite a long string of text, which is going to include all of the details about the job, who they're looking for, as well as any other additional details. So in theory, you could use a multi-line input, which would allow someone to add in long form text blocks. However, when it comes to the job platform here today, I'm gonna actually install a free plugin, which is going to allow us to add in a rich text editor. And now if you're not familiar with a rich text editor, perhaps the best way to show you an example of one of these in action is by clicking on my text element here. What you'll see is that within the input field, you have the ability to open up a rich text editor. And as soon as you see this, it's gonna more than likely look familiar. So a rich text editor just allows you to customize the text by using things like underlines, you can add colors to text, or you can even add links to a text if you'd like. 
So it just allows your users to fully customize the text that they add into your input field. I am just gonna cancel these changes here because I obviously don't want those to apply. But the reason I'm using a rich text editor today is because I want users to be able to add things like headings or any external links within the position description. And it's just going to allow us to create the same real world experience as most job boards out there. So before I add that input field in, the first thing I'd like to do is just make a copy of this text heading here. I'm then going to move this to the next position within my group. And then when it comes to this text element, I just wanna to head to my appearance tab and I'd like to update the text to display the words job description. Then below this, I'd like to add in my input field. Now by default, you won't have access to a rich text editor within your standard input forms. As I mentioned, it is a plugin you'll need to install. So we're gonna head over to our plugin tab here. We're going to open up our plugin library and we're just gonna type in the word rich text. And what you'll see is that there are two rich text editors here. Both are free and built by Bubble. However, we wanna install the most recent version, not the legacy version. So we're going to install the rich text editor. I'll click on this. I can then close my plugin library and jump over into my design tab once again. And what you'll now see is that within your input forms, you now have a rich text input field. So I'm going to add this into my group. And before I make any changes to this, I'm going to update the name of this to be called rich text input job description. And as you'll see, this rich text editor allows users to customize the text they add into this. So they can add things like headings, bullet points, change the formatting of it, or even add things like images as well. Now, when I'm working on a rich text editor, if I was to click away, what you'll see is that although the formatting options have a border around them, the actual input field below it does not. So I like to personally just click on the rich text editor and when I'm working on it, I like to just add a solid border around this. So that way I can see where it actually sits on my page. I'm also then just gonna need to click on this element once again, because of course I'll need to update the responsive settings for this element. So I'm gonna jump over into my layout tab here. And like always, I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'm then going to set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. And then when it comes to the height, I'm actually gonna leave the minimum height as 200. So that is this size here. And that's just going to leave enough space for someone to start typing in all of the text they'd like for this job ad. However, because we have a maximum height of infinite, this will continually expand down if more than a couple of lines of text are added into this field. The only other thing I'd then like to change is just the margin. And of course, I'm gonna set 15 pixels of margin on the left and 15 pixels of margin on the right. So that way it's in line with all of my additional input fields on this page. Finally, I'm then going to move this to the next position within my group. So that way it sits below the relevant title there. Then after adding my rich text input field, I'm going to add in yet another input field. And that's going to give a recruiter or company the option to essentially link this job ad out to an external application link. So within our tutorial today, we are going to allow people to apply for jobs directly on our platform. But sometimes you'll find that companies prefer to send people to their own platform or even their own ATS, which if you're not familiar, is just an applicant tracking system. It's kind of just like a CRM for recruiters. And so today I'm gonna to show you how we can cater for both options. And so what I'm gonna to want to do is add an input field on our page, which just allows a user to add in an external application link if that is where they want to send users through to in order to apply for this position. So the first thing I'm gonna to want to do is just make a copy of the text heading here. Then I will move this to the next position within my group. And when it comes to this text element, I want to head over to my appearance tab. I'm going to type in the words external application link. And then in brackets, I'm just going to say that this is optional. And now when it comes to the formatting of this text, I'm actually gonna to choose to unbold all of this text here. And the reason I'm doing that is because I'd only like the first part of this text to be in bold. I don't want the optional text to be in bold. And of course, in order to have full control over the formatting of all of this text, I can actually open up our rich text editor once again, and I can choose to highlight the first bit of the text. I can bold this, and then I'm going to highlight the optional text here. And instead of bolding that, I'm actually gonna put this in italics. I can then choose to save this. 
And so what you'll now see is that it has properly formatted all of this text for us. Then below this text, I'd like to add in an input field, which will allow someone to obviously add in that external application link. And in order to streamline the process of adding that input field in, I'm just going to make a copy of our existing job title input field here. I'm going to head over to our layout tab and just move this to the last position within our group. So it now sits below our text element we've just worked on. Of course, when it comes to this input field, the first thing I'll need to do is update the name of this. So I'm going to call this input job external application link. And so that way, when I build out my workflow, I know exactly which input field to reference here. And then because I've copied this input field from our existing one at the top of our group, I won't need to make any other changes to the responsive settings or things like the margins. Instead, I can move along to the next input field I'd like to add into our group. And that is going to be the input field that allows the recruiter or company to add the salary for this particular job. And so what I'm going to do is choose to select on our job description title. I'm going to make a copy of this and I'm going to move this to the last position within our group. Now at this point in time, I can start to see that my page is beginning to cut off just because we've added so many elements onto it. So if I just wanted to scale my page down a little bit more, so I have a bit of room to work with. What I can do is actually click on the overall page itself. So that is the gray element known as our post. And for the minimum height of this page, I could set this to be, let's say 2000 pixels. And that's going to give me plenty of room to work with here. Of course, before you go to preview or publish your app, you can go and set that back to the original height that it was. But for the time being, this is just going to give us more room to work with. Now for this text element that I've just copied, I'm going to click on this and head over to my appearance tab. And I'm going to have this just display the word salary. Below this, I'd like to add in an input field. So I'm going to make a copy of our job title input field. I'm going to head to our layout tab and move that to the last position within our group. Then when it comes to the name of this, I'm going to call this input salary. Now for this input field, before I update any of the layout settings, what I'd like to do is just jump over to my appearance tab. And the reason I'm doing this is because I'd like to update the content format that's stored within this input field. So right now the content format is set to be text. So that just allows someone to type in any free text they'd like into this field. Whereas I'd actually like to store this as a number and I'd like that number to be a currency. So I want this input field to display a dollar sign in front of any number that's added into this field. And the way I can do that is by updating the content format to be a currency. And I'm going to leave my currency prefix as dollars, but you can update that to be whatever you would like. And this is just going to allow me to store the input that's added into this field as a number, which matches the relevant data field in our database. The only other thing I'd like to change for this input field is just the width of it. So the salary itself isn't going to be very long. So it doesn't need all of this space that we've added for this input field. And so what I'd like to do is just cut this off to be the same width as our drop down menus above it on our page. So if I head over to our layout tab, I can just add a maximum width on this input field to be 250 pixels. And that will just ensure that it never becomes wider than this particular width. And that's everything I'll need to change. I'm quite happy with the height and the margins on this element. The next thing I'd like to do is add in one last input field into our first group here. And that input field is just going to allow the recruiter or company to select where this job will be located. So is it going to be in an office? Is it going to be remote or is it also going to be hybrid? And so before we add that input field in, I'm going to just make a one last copy of my text element here. I'll move this to the next position within my group and I'm going to head over to my appearance tab and I'm just going to update this to display the word location. I'd then like to add in a drop down menu, which someone can select from the list of option sets we created for our location. So if you remember in my data tab here under our option sets, we had an option set known as the job location. And so these options were office, remote and hybrid because we've already pre-built these. I'd like to once again, dynamically display those within our drop down menu. And so I'm going to jump back into my design tab. And to streamline the whole process of adding this input field in, I'm just going to select on one of my drop down menus. I'm going to make a copy of that and I'm just going to jump to my layout tab and move that to the last position within this group. Before I make any changes to the data source of the dynamic data for this drop down menu, I'd like to just update the name of this. 
So I'm just going to call this drop down location. Then from here, I'm going to head to my appearance tab and I'll just need to update the dynamic choice that I'm displaying in this field. So instead of this being the job type option set, I'd like this to be the job location option set. For the type of choices I'd like to display, I want to show all of the job locations. And for the caption, which is the text, I'd like it to be the current option sets display text. So that is the actual name of that itself. And because this is the last element I wanted to add into this group, what I'd like to do is add some margin at the bottom of this. So that way it's not touching the border of my group. So I'm going to jump to my layout tab and for the bottom margin, I'm just going to set this to be 30. And because I've now finished adding all of the elements inside of my group, I can click on the overall group itself, jump to my layout tab. And what I can now do is add some margins around the borders of this group. So it doesn't touch the borders of my page. So within our layout tab, the first thing I'm going to do before I update my margins is just update the minimum height to be zero. And because we have the option selected to fit the height of this element to the content within it, it's going to just make sure it collapses nicely around all of our elements. And then finally, when it comes to the margins, I'm just going to add in 20 pixels of margin at the top, 20 on the left and 20 on the right. I won't add in any at the bottom, but that completes the very first group I'd like to add onto our page here. So this allows a recruiter or company to add in all of the relevant details about the job that they would like to publish. What I'd like to do is just make a copy of this group though because I'd also like the recruiter or company to add in all of the details about the company itself that's publishing this job. And in order to streamline that process, I'm just going to make a copy of this existing group. So I'm going to select to copy that. I'll click on my overall page and paste in another version. Now, before I make any changes to this group, the first thing I'd like to do is just head up to the name of this group and call this step one company details. So that way later on when I either hide or display this group, I know what it's called within my elements tree. I'm also then just going to select on the main text heading within this group. And instead of this displaying the words position details, I'm going to update this to display the words company details. Now, when it comes to all of the details I want to store for a company, there is quite a few input fields I'll need to add. And so what I'm actually going to do is I'm just going to leave my first input field in here. However, I'm going to select on every other input field that is below this and I'm just going to delete these just because I'd like to recreate this group from almost scratch again. So I'm just going to delete these input fields here. I'm going to select on the text above my only input field in this group and I'm going to update the name of this to be called company name. I'm then going to select on the input field below this and I'll also update the title of this to be called input company name. And of course, I won't need to make any other changes to the layout settings because this was copied across from our previous group. So right now it is fully responsive. Below this input field though, what I'd like to do is add in another that's going to allow the company to add in almost like an overview or description about the company. And so before I add in that input field, I'm going to make a copy of this text element. I'll move this to the next position within my group. And I'm going to have this text display the words company overview. And now for the input field I'm going to use here, I'm not going to use just a standard single line input. Instead, I'm going to use the multi line input option just so that way if a company wants to add in quite a bit of detail about who they are and what they do, they'll have the space to do that. So I'm going to select to add in a multi line input field and I'm going to call this multi line input company overview. Then I'm going to need to update the responsive settings for this input field. So I'm going to jump over into my layout tab. The first thing I'm going to do is just move this to the next position within my group. So that way it sits below its relevant heading there. I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I will like always set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. So that way it will take up as little or as much space as it can in our overall group. I'm then going to set the minimum height at 45 pixels, which is the same height as the input fields I've used above it there. I'm going to keep the maximum height as infinite. So that way, if a user needs to add in more than one line of text, this element can continually expand downwards and fit that in. I'm just going to add in 15 pixels on the left and 15 pixels on the right. So that way it is in line with any of the previous input fields I've added onto my page. And that's all I'll need to change for this input field. The next piece of data I'd like to register for a company is just their logo. So I'm going to make a copy of this text element here. I'll move that to the next position 
and I'll just have this display the word company logo. And then below this, I'm gonna to want to add in a picture upload element. So that way the recruiter or company can upload an image of their logo. So I'm gonna to head to my input forms. I'll add in a picture uploader element. I'm going to first of all, update the name of this to be called picture uploader company logo. Now, when it comes to this particular picture uploader, I'm going to remove the style of this because I'd like to make this a perfect circle. So if I scroll on down to the borders, I can update the roundness of this to be 100. So now it is in fact that perfect circle I wanted. I'll then jump over into my layout tab because I'd like to now update the size of this as well. And when it comes to the size of this element, it's currently at a fixed width and height of 150. So that just means it's never going to be any larger or smaller than this size here, which in my opinion, is just a little bit too big. So I'm gonna set the width as 100 pixels and the height at 100 pixels. And I am going to keep these as fixed values because I'd only ever like this input to be this exact size. However, while we're here, I'm just going to add 15 pixels of margin on the left and 15 pixels of margin on the right. And that's all I'll need to change for this picture uploader element. Below that, I'd like to add in an input field that's going to allow someone to add in the link to their company website, which of course someone can click through from on the job ad once it's published. And so for that piece of information, I'm just gonna use a regular input field. And to streamline the time of creating that from scratch, I'm going to select on both my text element at the top here, as well as the input field below it. I'm gonna make a copy of those. I'm then going to click on my text element. I'll move that to the last position within our group. And I'm going to click on my appearance tab and just update the name of this because I'd like this to display the words company website. I'm then going to click on the input field that I had copied. I will jump over to my layout tab and move this to the last position within my group. And I'll just need to update the name of this input field to be called input company website. Then below this input field, I'd like to add in another, which is going to allow the company to add their actual office address. So this is where the headquarters, I guess you could say is located. And in order to add and store that location information, I'm not gonna use a regular input field. Instead, I'm gonna use something else. But before I do that, I'm just gonna need to make a copy of my text element here. I'll move this to the next position. And I'm going to update the name of this to display the words company address. And now when it comes to being able to store an address, what you can do is actually leverage what's known as a search box input element. So within our input forms, if we scroll on down, you'll see the ability to add in a search box element. Now a search box allows you to dynamically display data or search through data that's in your database. So for instance, if you wanted to search through a list of all of the users in your database, you could start typing in someone's name and it would display a list of relevant suggestions that you could select from. However, the search box also has one more really important use and that is searching and linking through to real world addresses. So this search box can actually link to Google Maps and the way you can access that is by updating the choices style for this search box. So you can either search through a list of dynamic choices in your database, or you can search through geographic places, which would automatically then link this search box to Google Maps. So if you start typing in an address, it's going to automatically display a list of predicted search results based on the value you type in. And then when you select that address, it's going to actually format that as a real world location. And so today we're going to use the geographic places option. Before I make any changes to the layout settings of this input field, I'm going to just update the name of this. I'm going to call this search box company address. I'll then jump over into my layout tab and similar to all of our previous input elements, I'm just going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'll set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. I'll also set the height at 45, leaving that as a fixed value. And then for the margins of this element, I'm just gonna add in 15 pixels of margin on the left and 15 pixels of margin on the right. I'll then move this to the last position in our group so that way it sits below its relevant heading there. Then below this, I have just two last fields I'd like to add into our company details. And the first is going to be the total count of employees that a company has. And because I'd like to use just a standard input field for this information, I'm going to make a copy of both my text element and the input element at the top of my group. So I'll copy those. I'll first of all select on my text element and move this to the last position within my group. 
And I'd like this to display the words employee count. I'm then going to scroll on up to the input field I copied. I will head to my layout tab and move this to the last position within my group. And the first thing I'll need to do is once again, update the name of this to be called import employee count. And now with this employee count, it's not going to be a relatively long string of text. So of course we're going to allow someone to type in a number here, but it will be formatted as text, not an actual number. The reason why I'm not formatting it as a number in my database is because you only really need to use a number if you want to perform calculations on something. Whereas in this case, I'm only ever going to want to display this as a text element, but this text element isn't going to be very long. So I don't need all of this empty space within my input field. So similar to before, what I'm going to do is head to my layout tab and under the maximum width of this input field, I just like to set that to be 250 pixels. So that way it reduces the total width of it to this size. And from here, I won't need to change any other settings like the height or the margins. The only other input field I'd like to add into this group is just the year that the company was founded. And I'm going to want that input field to be the exact same size as the employee count input field. So I'm just going to select on the text element as well as the input field below it, make a copy of those, just move the text element down. I'll select the appearance tab for our text element. And I'm just going to have this display the words year founded. I'll then select on the text element below this. And the only change I'll need to make is just to the title of this input field. So I'm going to call this input year founded. It's nice and straightforward. And that is the very last input field I'd like to add into our company details group. So at the bottom of this, I'm going to want to add in some margin. So this input element doesn't touch the group itself. So I'll jump to our layout tab and at the bottom margin, I'm just going to set that to be 30 and that completes everything I want to add in for step one of the process where a company or recruiter is going to add in the details about the position as well as the details of their company. The last thing I'll just need to do is add in a button, which when clicked will allow our recruiter or company to advance through to the next stage of our job posting process. So I'm just going to head up to my visual elements and I'm going to add a button element onto my page here. And I'm going to have this button display the word continue to preview. But when it comes to this button, I'd actually like to update the name of this. I'm going to call this button step one. So that way when I create a workflow later on, I know exactly which button we're clicking within each individual step of our process. Now, before we build out any workflows, I'd also just like to update the responsive settings and the layout of this button itself. So I'm going to jump over into our layout tab here. And when it comes to the width of this button, I just like to update this to be 200 pixels in width. Now I am going to keep this as a fixed width because I won't want this to become any smaller or larger always going to want it to be 200 pixels. I'm happy to keep the height settings as they are, but when it comes to the margin, I'd also just like to add in 30 pixels of margin at the top, 30 on the bottom, 20 on the left and 20 on the right. And so that's just going to position this in line with all of the groups on our page. And that completes everything I want to add into step one of this process. So when this button is now clicked, what I'd like to do is essentially move someone onto the next stage of our process which is where they can actually view a preview of the job ad that they'd like to publish. And so when someone clicks on this button, what I'd like to do is actually hide all of these groups on our page and then display another group, which is going to contain a preview of our job post. And the way in which I can hide and display groups is by leveraging what's known as a custom state. Now, if you're relatively new to bubble, custom states can be a little bit confusing to wrap your head around but essentially they're just a great way to temporarily store data within your page without having to reference data in your database. So in our example today, what I want to do is just store the value of which stage we're at throughout our posting process. So are we in step one? Are we in step two or are we in step three? And as I mentioned in step one, we're going to add in the details of a job post. Step two, we're going to view the actual preview of the job post. And in step three, we're going to accept a payment for this job post. And so in order to recognize what step we should be in, I can store that relevant information in my page using a custom state. And so in order to create a custom state, I'm going to click on my overall page. So this is my post. 
And if you were to open up this little information icon, it's kind of like a little hidden backdoor menu. What you'll see is that it opens what's known as the element inspector. So this is where you can store a custom state. Now, if I create a new custom state, what you'll see is that it kind of looks like the same process as creating a data field. And that's because you essentially are, you're just creating a data field that's stored on your page temporarily. And the benefit to this is that you actually don't need to store data in your database. So it's not gonna slow your application down. And so in this case today, I'm going to create three different custom states. The first one will be known as step one. And for this state type, it's going to be a yes, no type because we're either going to be in step one or we're not going to be. I'm gonna to choose to create this. And now for the default value of this state, I'd like to set this to be yes, because as soon as this page is loaded, I'd like to display the step one process. So this is where the user can add in all of the details about the job and their company. I'm then gonna create another custom state and I'm gonna call this step two. And for this state type, it's going to once again be a yes, no type. I'll choose to create this. Only this time it's gonna have a default value of no because I'm not going to want to automatically display this stage whenever the page is loaded. Instead, I'm only gonna want it to be displayed when I choose it to after the user selects that they've finished with step one. And then finally, I'm going to add in another custom state, which is going to be called step three. And this state type is going to be a yes, no value once again. And of course, this is also going to have a default value of no, because I'm not gonna to want to display this by default. I'm only gonna to want to display this when I select it to. And so now that we've added all of these custom states onto our page, what we can do is actually create a workflow that will allow us to change the values of these states. So when I recognize that I'm finished with step one, I can set the value of this to be no, and then change the value of step two to be yes. And so if I close my element inspector here, I'm gonna scroll on down to the button, which is known as my button step one. I'm gonna select on my appearance tab and I'm gonna to choose to start a workflow whenever this button is clicked. And so within this workflow, what I'd like to do is create an action. And I'm just gonna type in the word state and I'm gonna to choose to set the state of an element. The element I'd like to set the state for is our overall page. So that is known as our post. And for the custom state I'd like to set, I'm going to first of all select the step one state and I'm going to switch its value to be no, because of course, if you remember, its default value is yes. I'm then going to then set another state, and that state is going to be the step two state, and I'm now going to set its value to be yes. So I'll be able to easily identify that I'm ready to show the next stage of our job posting process. And now that's everything we'll need to create within this workflow. If I just jump back into my design tab, at this point, we've created a way to set the relevant state on our page. However, we're gonna to need to create a way to reflect that state on the actual page itself. So if we're no longer in step one of our process, I'm not gonna want all of the step one groups to be visible. And so I'm gonna need a way to actually hide all of these elements whenever they're not needed. And the way I can do that is by adding a condition onto each one of my elements. So for instance, my main heading, my two groups, and then the relevant button at the bottom of my page. And so if I select on the very first heading here, the step one create, what I'd like to do is head over to my conditional tab and I'd like to define a condition. And I would just like to recognize when the step one custom state is currently active. So I'm gonna need to type in the word post to reference my overall page where we had added that state. And I'm going to reference when it's step one custom state is in fact, yes. I'd like to select that this element is visible and tick that that should be true, which means that if it's going to be visible when the step one state is yes, I'm gonna need to jump over to my layout tab here and unselect that this should be visible at any other time. And I'll also select to collapse this element when it's hidden, which just means that when this element is not visible on our page, it's not going to take up any space. Now from here, I'm gonna to need to create the exact same condition on our group below this. And to streamline the process, what I can actually do is right click on my text element. And if I scroll on down to the option here, you'll be able to copy the conditional formatting, which just copies this exact condition we've created. So if I select on my group, which is the step one job details, I can right click on this and choose to paste the conditional formatting. 
and you'll see it's going to paste the condition that we've just created. So right now this group is going to be visible when the step one custom state is in fact yes, which it will be by default. However, of course, I'll just need to jump over to our layout tab because I'd also like to unselect that this element should be visible on page load. So that means it's only going to be visible whenever that condition is true. And I'm also going to select to collapse this element whenever it's hidden. So that way it doesn't take up any space on our page. I'll then scroll on down to our group that displays the company details. I will right click on this and paste the same conditional formatting. So if I now open up our conditional tab, it's going to recognize when the step one state is yes, this element will be visible, which means I'm gonna need to once again, jump into my layout tab and I will unselect that this element should be visible on page load, as well as choose to collapse this element whenever it's hidden. And then finally, I will scroll on down to the very last element, which is my button step one. I'm going to once again, right click on this and paste in my conditional formatting, which I can see that's copied that across successfully. I'll then jump to my layout tab and I will unselect that this element should be visible on page load and collapse this element when it's hidden. And so that is how we can hide all of the elements that are stored within the step one stage of our job posting process. And from here on out, we can now build out all of the elements that are going to be displayed in step two of the process. And so because I no longer want to see all of these elements on my page, what I can actually do is head over to my elements tree. I can open this up and I can select to only show hidden elements. And if I want to hide all of these elements, I can just select on the eye icon and it will just collapse those from my page. Of course, if you'd ever like to view those again, you can select the eye icon and make those visible. But what I'd like to now do is just create the preview of this job ad itself. And so before I hide this text element, once again, I'm actually just going to make a copy of this. And what you'll see is that the copy itself will be hidden by default as well. And that's because it's copied across the exact same conditional formatting as the existing heading we made the copy of. But if I click on this heading here, what I'm gonna do is first of all, head over to my appearance tab, and I'm going to update the title that's displayed to display the text step two preview. I'm then gonna to need to jump to my conditional tab and I'm just going to update the condition to only display this text when the post, which is our overall page, when it's step two custom state is yes, this will be visible. Now that I finished with my existing heading, I'm just going to choose to hide that. And now below this text element, I'd like to display a preview of the job ad itself. Now, in order to streamline the whole process of creating that, you may remember that we've actually already created the formatting for our job ad on our homepage. So if I jump up to my page dropdown menu and open up our index page, at this point in time, we've added a repeating group onto this page. And this repeating group, of course, has a group inside of it that displays the details of a job. And so what we can do is actually select on this yellow group here, which is known as our group job post. And we can make a copy of this and paste this in on our new page. However, before I do that, there's one thing I'd like to do, and that is just update the roundness of the borders on this yellow group. This is just something I didn't do when we first built out the group. So I'm just gonna want to set the borders here to be 10, just so that way it has some curved edges. Again, this isn't gonna change the entire trajectory of our application but it's just a small personal preference I have. I'm now going to make a copy of this yellow group, not the repeating group it sits within, just the group itself. I'm then going to open up our page dropdown menu, open up our post page, and before I paste in a version of this, I'll need to display my step two preview text. I'll click on my page and paste in this group. Now, once I pasted this in, I'm gonna to jump to my layout tab and move this to the last position on my page here. Now, when it comes to this group, if I jump over to my appearance tab, you may remember that because this group used to sit within a repeating group, it had a data source on it. That is no longer necessary because at this point in time, we're not going to dynamically pull a job post from our database and display it within this group. Instead, we're just going to reference all of the details added in the inputs throughout step one of our posting process. So when I click on this yellow group, I'm just going to update the type of content to be empty. Then for the data source, I'm just going to right click on this and clear the expression. And now from here, I'll just need to update the data source of all of the elements that sit within my groups. So for our image here, instead of pulling a dynamic image from my database, 
I'm just going to reference the image stored within the picture uploader within step one of our job posting process. So to start things off, in my dynamic image field, I'm going to right click on this and clear this expression. I'm then going to insert dynamic data and just reference the value stored within the company logo input field. So I'm just gonna type in the word logo and I'm going to reference the value of our picture uploader company logo. Just a personal preference of mine is that I'm also going to process this image with Imgix, just so I can select this choice to resize the dimensions by cropping them. I'll then close that. Now, when it comes to the preview of our job ad, I'd also just like to make the image a little bit larger here. So I'm gonna jump over to my layout tab. And at this point in time, I can see this image has a fixed width of 60 pixels and it has an aspect ratio of one to one. So it's only ever gonna be 60 pixels by 60 pixels. What I'd just like to do is set the width to be 80. So now it's going to be 80 pixels by 80 pixels. That's all I wanna change here. I'll then jump over to the company name. And if I head over to my appearance tab here, what I'm gonna do is right click in this input field and clear this expression. And so when it comes to this text, I'm gonna to want to display the company name stored within the input field in step one of our process. So I will insert dynamic data and I'm just gonna type in the word name and I'm gonna reference the data stored in the input company name, its value. And now I won't need to make any changes to the styling of this element. It's going to be the exact same as the styling we'd copied across. I'm then going to select on the job title. I will right click in this and clear this expression. I will insert dynamic data and just type in the word title. And now I'd like to reference the information stored in the input job title field. It's nice and straightforward. And then finally, I'm going to select on the type of role for this position. I will once again, right click in this, clear this expression. I will then insert dynamic data and I'm just going to type in the word drop down and I'll reference the drop down job type, its selected value, the display text of that value. So that is the title of the option set that someone has selected. Now, while we're working on all of these text elements, what I'd also like to do is just jump over into my layout tab. And I'd just like to unselect that we should fit the width of these elements to the content inside of them. And that's just going to expand it out across the group it sits within. So I'm just going to select the second option. I will unselect this choice and then select on our first bit of text and also unselect this option here. I'm then going to click on the blue group that all of these text elements sit within. And this is where I'm going to select to fit the width of this element to the content inside of it. And so that's just going to move that across and collapse it around all of these elements. And now that's everything I'll need to change within our blue group here. Of course, you may remember that within our job ad, we had also displayed the date in which this job was created. Thankfully, what I can do is just jump over to my appearance tab right click on this text and clear this expression. And then I can just insert dynamic data, type in the word date and just reference the current date time. And if I really wanted, I could also choose to format this as a particular style. In this case, I'm going to have the month followed by the date. I'll select that. I'll choose to close this. And then finally, I will jump over to this new tag here. And the only thing I'll need to change here is if I jump into the conditional tab, you may remember that this had a condition on it that was only going to allow it to be displayed whenever this job ad was posted within the last 10 days. What I'd just like to do is remove this because I'd always like it to be displayed. And so that's going to help me create that experience. Now that's everything I'll need to change when it comes to the data source for each of my elements here. One thing I have just noticed though is that I have a couple of issues in my application. And if I was to click on this, what I can see is that within my blue group, I still have a type of content linked to it. And because I no longer need that, I'm just going to set that to be empty and that will fix those issues there. And once I've removed the type of content, I'll also just need to remove the data source. So I'll right click in here and clear that expression and that will now fix those issues for me. Now, when it comes to our overall preview group, what I can see is that it's actually quite long on our page. And so in order to fix that, what I can do is select on the group itself, head over to our layout tab here and just scroll on down to my maximum width. Now on our homepage, I'd set the maximum width to be 100. Whereas here I could experiment with a couple of different widths. So I'm just gonna say 800 pixels. 
And to be honest, I'm actually quite happy with that width there. So I am going to keep the maximum width as 800, which just means that regardless of the page size, this is as wide as the element will ever become. The only other thing I'd like to change while I'm working in my layout tab for this group is the margins around this. So for the top margin, I'm going to set that to be 30. I'm then actually going to remove the bottom margin. For the left margin, I'm going to set this to be 60. And that's just going to push this group further to the right hand side of my page. And then for the right hand margin, I'm going to set that to be 20. Now I'm also going to update the name of this group to be called group step two preview. And of course, I'm going to need to create a condition on this group that will only allow this to be displayed when we are in step two of our job posting process. So I'm going to head to our conditional tab. I'm going to define a condition and I'm just going to recognize when our overall page, which is known as our post, when it's step two custom state is in fact, yes. What I'd like to do is select that this element is visible and tick that that is true, which means I'm then also going to need to create a way to hide this element at any other point in time. So I'm going to jump over to my layout tab. I will unselect that this element should be visible on page load and I'll select to collapse this element when it's hidden, and that'll help me create exactly what I want. One thing I should also just point out is that because we copy this element across from our home page, all of the responsive settings on this should have copied across with it. So if I was to click on the date that's going to be displayed for this job ad preview, you may remember that we had a condition that hides this at a certain page width. Now, if I was to jump over to my responsive tab and just hide all of my existing groups here, and just display the preview text as well as the preview of the job ad. If I reduce the width of this page, it's still going to be completely responsive there, which is the exact experience I want to create. So we won't need to make any additional changes to the responsive settings of this group. I will just jump back to my UI builder because the very last thing I'd like to do within our step two of our posting process is just add in another button, which when clicked is going to turn off the step two state and then turn on the step three state. And so in order to add that button in, I'm actually going to streamline the process by making a copy of the button we used for step one. So in my elements tree here, I'm going to view my button step one. I'm going to make a copy of this which I can see is now being hidden by default. So I'm going to display that, then hide the first button that I made a copy of. I'm going to open up my property editor. And the first thing I'm going to do is just update the name of this button to be called button step two. And then when it comes to the text displayed in this button, I'm going to have this display the words continue to payment. Now, because this text requires a little bit more room, as you can see, it's collapsed onto a new line. What I might need to do is jump over into my layout tab and just update the width of this. So currently it is at a fixed width of 200 pixels. Whereas if I set this to be a fixed width of 250 pixels, it's going to display all of this text onto one line. I'm then going to move this to the next position on my page, which will just move it below my job ad preview. And then finally, I'll jump to my conditional tab because I'll also need to update the condition that just identifies when this button should be displayed. So I'm just going to recognize that this button should be visible when our overall post page, when it's step two custom state is in fact, yes, this should be visible. From here, I'm then gonna need to create a workflow that updates the custom state of our page once again, whenever this particular button is clicked. So if I jump over to my appearance tab, I'm gonna choose to start a workflow whenever this button is clicked. And within this workflow, it's gonna be much the same as our first workflow. So I'm just gonna type in the word state and I'll select to set the state of an element. The element I'd like to set the state of is our post page. And in this case, I'm going to first of all, turn off the step two custom state. So I'm going to set that value to be no. And then I'm going to set another state, which is now going to be our step three state. And in this case, I'd like to set that to be yes. So now in theory, all of the elements that are linked to the step two of our posting process will no longer be visible. And now because both of these workflows are linked to the feature of changing a custom state, what I personally like to do when I'm working with multiple workflows linked to one specific feature is just color code these the same. So that way I can tell that they're a part of the same feature. So I'm going to click on my workflow trigger here and just set the event color here to be orange. I'll then do the exact same thing for the step one button. 
So whenever the button is clicked, I had a workflow trigger, which of course within that updated the custom state of my page. So I'll now also set the event color of this to be orange as well. Then from here, we can jump back into our design tab. And it's at this point that we can build out the last series of elements that are going to be displayed within step three of our job posting process. And thankfully, all of the elements we're adding into step three are relatively straightforward. So the first thing I'm gonna to wanna to do is actually just make a copy of my heading element on my page once again. So I'm gonna select on the step two preview text. I'm gonna make a copy of this. Now, because this text is not displayed by default, remembering that it's only displayed when this condition is true, that means that this is not going to be visible as soon as we've made a copy of it. So I'm gonna to head to my elements tree and just choose to display this text here. Now, when it comes to this text, I'm just gonna update this to display the words step three payment. Then I'll also jump over into my conditional tab here and update the condition that just references when this particular text should be displayed on our page. And instead of having this be displayed when the step number two is set to yes, I'd like to update this to only be displayed when the step number three state is in fact set to yes. Then from here, I'm going to hide the original text that I've copied as well as the group that contains my job ad preview and the button as well. And below this text element, I just like to add in a group which is just going to house some additional text. So I'm gonna scroll on down to our containers. I'm gonna to choose to add a group onto my page. I'll jump to my appearance tab and I'm just going to remove the style of this group because I'd like to set the background style to be a flat color, which of course that's going to be white. I'm then going to set the roundness of this group's borders to be 20 just so that way it has some curved edges. Then finally, I'd also like to take the time to update the name of this group. I'm gonna call this group step three payment. So that way in my elements tree later on, I can easily reference what this element is and where it belongs. I'm then gonna jump into my layout tab because I'd like to obviously make this element fully responsive on my page. But before I do that, I'm gonna to need to set the container layout. Now, similar to our previous groups, I'm gonna be stacking elements in this from top to bottom. So the container layout will be a column. I'm then going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I will set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. Now, before I update the height or any of the margins, I'm gonna add my text elements inside of this group. And the very first element I'd like to add into this group is just going to be similar to the blue heading I had added into my previous groups. So if I just head over to my elements tree and open up the group step one job details. I'm just going to click on this position details text, make a copy of that and paste it into my new group. I'm then gonna to choose to hide the step one group once again. Then when it comes to this text, I'm gonna to jump to my appearance tab and I'm just going to update the text that's displayed in this. So I'm gonna have this be the words post summary. And now I won't need to update any of the styling or any of the responsive settings because I've already copied those across. Then below this, I'd like to add in another text element, which is just going to highlight what's included in our job post that someone's about to purchase. So I'm going to head to my visual elements and add in another text element. Now in this text element, I'd actually like to add a list of bullet points. And the way I can do that is by opening up my rich text editor. And what you'll see is the ability to format text with bullet points. So I'm gonna select this option here. And then within this text field, I'm just going to highlight what someone's going to get out of this particular job post. So I'm gonna say that they're gonna get placement on the job board. I'll then enter onto a new line and add a new bullet point. Then I'll also write that they'll get an email to 10,000 startup job seekers. And by all means, you could just make up whatever is relevant to your own job board here. But I'm just gonna add in a couple of examples. I'm gonna add in one more line here and I'm gonna have this say that they're going to get social media content to promote position. I will then choose to save this text here. And within my text field, I can just see that there is an open line at the top here, which I just wanna get rid of. So I'm gonna to go to the front of my HTML formatting around my text. I'm just gonna hit the backspace key and that'll move everything up a line. And then I'm gonna do the exact same thing for the bottom. So I can see there's a couple of additional lines at the bottom of this element. So I'm just gonna remove those there. I'll also then select to remove the style of this element and set the font size here to be 16. Finally, I'll then jump over into my layout tab 
and I'm gonna need to make this element fully responsive. So I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I will like always set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. Now for the height, I'm gonna set that this should also be zero, making sure we've selected this option to fit the height of this element to the content around it. Then when it comes to the margins, I'm gonna add in 20 pixels of margin at the top, 20 on the left and 20 on the right. And that's everything I'll need to configure within my layout tab. One thing I have just noticed though, is that there still is quite a bit of empty space at the top of this element here. So what I'm gonna do is just delete this first line within the element itself. And what you'll then see is that that's going to move it up inside of the element. I'm then just going to remove the last line itself within the HTML. Now this HTML that I'm removing here just structures this as a list. However, if I remove this, what you'll see is that you still have a functional list of bullet points, which is the exact experience we wanna to create today. Then below this text element, I'd like to add in one more, which is just going to include a summary of how much this job ad is going to cost in order to publish. And so in order to streamline this process, I'm actually just going to copy this text element at the top of my page, which is the step three payment. I'm gonna paste a version of that into my group here. And of course, by default, this element is hidden. So I'm gonna to need to head over to my elements tree and display that within my group. I'm just gonna quickly then jump over into my conditional tab and remove this condition. Then head over to my layout tab and tick that this element should be visible every single time the page is loaded. And then finally, while I'm here, I'd also like to update the top margin to be 20, not 30. I'll then jump into my appearance tab and I'm going to update the text for this element to display the words total cost followed by semicolon and then you can add in whatever cost you'd like to charge for a job ad. In this case, I'm gonna say it's 2.99. The only other change I'd like to make to this element is that I'm gonna update the font size here to be 18, not 20, just so that way the text is slightly smaller. And now because this is the last element I'd like to add into my group here, I'm gonna need to add in some margin at the bottom of this, just so this text element doesn't touch the borders of the group. So if I jump back to my layout tab again, I'm gonna select that I'd like to add in 30 pixels of margin at the bottom. Then I'm going to select on my overall group that houses all of these elements. And I'm gonna jump to my layout tab. And the first thing I'd like to do is just set the minimum height here to be zero. And because we have this option selected by default to fit the height of this element to the content within it, it's going to collapse nicely around all of the elements inside of it there. Then after updating the height of this group, I'd like to just add in some margins. So I'm gonna add in 30 pixels of margin at the top, 20 on the left and 20 on the right. And that will just ensure that this group does not touch the borders of my page. Now from here, the very last thing we'll need to do on this group is obviously just create a condition that's going to hide and display this whenever the step three custom state is currently set to yes. So we're gonna to head to our conditional tab here we're going to define a condition. And within this condition, I'm just going to reference the overall page, which is known as our post. And in this case, I'm just gonna identify it when the step three custom state is in fact set to yes. What I'd like to do is select that this element should be visible and tick that that is true, which means that I'm then gonna to need to jump into my layout tab here and unselect that this element should not be visible on page load because I'd obviously only like this to be displayed whenever that condition is true. I'm then going to also tick to collapse this element when it's hidden. So that way when it's not being displayed, it doesn't take up any space on my page. And that's everything I'll need to add in this group. The very last thing I'll need to add onto my page is one last button, which when clicked is later on going to trigger a workflow that not only creates a job post in our database, but allows us to process a payment as well. So I'm gonna to head to my visual elements and I'm going to add in a button element onto my page here. And the first thing I'm gonna do is update the name of this to be called button step three. So that way when I create a workflow later on, I know which button to reference at any point in time. And now when it comes to the text inside of this button, I'm gonna have this display the words pay and publish. And for the layout settings of this button, I'm gonna to jump to my layout tab. I'm going to update the width of this to be 250 pixels. And I'd like to keep this as a fixed width. So that means that it's always going to be 250 pixels. For the height, I'm gonna keep the default settings as they are, cause I'm quite happy with that. And then the very last thing I'd like to do is just add in some margin around the borders of this button. 
So for the top margin, I'm gonna set this to be 30 pixels. For the bottom margin, that will also be 30. And then for the left and right margins, I'm gonna set that as 20. Now I'm gonna also need to create a condition on this button that only allows this to be displayed whenever the step three stage of our process is currently set to yes. So I'm gonna to jump to our conditional tab. I'm going to define a new condition and I'm just going to recognize when the overall post page, when it's once again step three custom state is currently set to yes. I'd like to select that this element is visible and tick that that should be true which means I'm also gonna to need to then hide this button by default. So I'm gonna to jump to my layout tab here. I will head on up and unselect that this element should be visible on page load. And finally select to collapse this element when it's hidden. So that way it doesn't take up any space on my page. And thankfully that is the very last element we'll need to add into this whole process. As I mentioned, within a future module, I'm actually gonna cover how we can build out the workflows that run whenever someone clicks this button here because within that workflow, I'd like to not only take a payment for this job ad, but also create that job ad in our database. But I wanted to break that down into a separate module because at this point in time, we've already spent quite a bit of time just running through the process of designing this page itself. And it definitely took a little bit longer just because we also had to learn and also implement how we could use custom states within our app. But at this point in time, we should have a solid basis for the beginning of the process of how someone can publish a job ad on our job board. What I'd love to do is just quickly show you a preview of how this whole page is now going to function when it comes to actually creating a new job ad. Over in a preview of my job board, I'm currently on the home page and I'm logged into the account that I had previously created. What I'd now like to do is just head on up to my navigation menu and select to post a job. And that's gonna redirect me through to my dedicated post page, which as you can see at this point in time, by default, the step one custom state is set to yes. So I'm only seeing elements within the step one process. I should just move my head to the other side of the page for now. So what we can do within this process is choose to add in the details of a job. Now, just remember at this point in time, we're not able to actually publish a job. So anything I add in here is just going to disappear essentially once I refresh the page. But just to give you a good idea of how this page is going to function, I'm just gonna add in an example. So for the job title, I could set this to be, let's say a bubble, no code, developer. For the category of this job, it could be development. I could say this is a full-time position. And then when it comes to the job description, what I could do is actually grab some dummy text from Lorem Ipsum. So I'm going to open up a new browser. I'm just gonna search for Lorem Ipsum, which if you're not familiar, is just a great way to generate sample text to add into your application. So I'm just gonna grab this text here, which is some sample text, jump back into my bubble app. And I'm just gonna type in a heading that says about this role. I will then add in this text. I'll add in another line and I'll say about you. I'll then paste in my sample text again. And now because we're using a rich text editor here, I can actually choose to highlight any of my text and I can bold this. I can update the size so that is a large heading. I'll do the same for my second heading there. And as you can see, that is how powerful a rich text editor is. It allows you to format the text however you would like. I can scroll on down and then set the salary. Let's say it's $100,000 a year. And as you'll see, because I've set the type of content of this input field to be a currency, it is successfully storing a dollar amount within the field. For the location, I could say this is a remote position. And then when it comes to the company details, you can add all of those in. And so what I'm gonna do is just add in my company name and just type in the words building with bubble. For the company overview, I could just paste in my sample text once again, and I might just cut it off here because that's more in line with what a short description of a company might be like. For the company logo, I can upload this within my picture uploader element. Then once that logo has uploaded, I can add in my website, which is buildingwithbubble.com. Then for the company address, I could type in a real world address if that is where my headquarters is located. I'm just gonna type in a sample address. And as you'll see, these will link to real world addresses within Google Maps. So I'm just gonna select this address here in San Francisco. For the employee count, I'll just say it is 100. And for the year founded, I'll just say 2020. 
I'm then going to scroll on down and select the continue to preview option. That's going to then turn off the step one custom state within our page. And it's then going to turn on the step two custom state. And at this point in time, you'll now see a preview of what our job ad is going to look like here. And once I'm happy with that, I can select that I want to continue to the payment. It's going to turn off the step two custom state and activate the step three custom state, which means it's going to now display the relevant group. And just like that, that's how you can start to see the process of our job posting feature come to life. One thing I should just point out is that if I refresh the page here, it's going to just reset all of my custom states and all of my input fields. One thing I noticed is that when I had selected to continue to the preview, this group had hidden because our step one custom state was switched to no. But because we had scrolled so far down on our page, it's currently blank right now. So a user might think that something's happened to the page and they can't see their job preview. Whereas in fact, all we needed to do was scroll up on the page in order to view our preview here. And in order to create that experience, what we can actually do is just jump back into our bubble editor. And within my editor, if I jump into my workflow and open up the very first workflow we created when the step one button was clicked. At this point in time, I was updating the custom state to turn off the step one custom state and obviously turn on the step two custom state. But what I can also do is add an additional step into this workflow. And if I just type in the word scroll, I'm gonna to select to scroll to an element. And in this case, I'd like the element to be our overall post page, which just means that this is now going to scroll back to the top of the page. So if I jump back into bubble and refresh my post page, what I'm gonna do is scroll to the bottom here and select to continue to the preview. And then that's now going to scroll me back up to the top of the page where a user can now view the preview of their job ad. Jumping back into my checklist, I'm going to tick off that we've finished creating the feature that allows someone to add in the information they'd like to store within a job ad. And of course that includes all of the information about the job position as well as the company. And as I mentioned within the next module, that's where we're going to cover how users can process payments as well as how we can actually create that job within our database. And thankfully that is a relatively straightforward process, but I just wanted to split this into two different sections, just because at this point in time, we've been building for quite a while. And so I just wanted to simplify this by breaking it down into more bite-sized pieces. And unfortunately that is all I have time to include within our tutorial today. As you can see, we've been building for hours and there's still so many features that I wanna cover in more detail. At this point, we're still yet to create the dedicated page, which allows us to display the full details of a job listing, as well as, of course, allow someone to actually apply for that position directly on our platform. And then, of course, I also wanted to explain how we could create a custom search feature that allows users to search and filter a list of job listings by a specific role title that they're looking for. And all of these features are covered within the full version of this course, which if you wanted to get access to that, I'd recommend hitting the link in the description of this video. Now, while this full course is going to cost you money, I'm more than confident that it's going to save you months of time having to learn how to rebuild each of these features from scratch. So I definitely think it's worth checking out if you wanna launch your product as quickly as possible. Of course, in the meantime, if you wanted to stay up to date with any additional tutorials I share, I'd recommend hitting that subscribe button on my channel so that way you can be the first to know whenever I drop a new video. But until then, I just wanted to say a massive thank you for taking the time to watch this video up to this point, And I wish you all of the best on your own no-code journey.